The Tao of Capital, Austrian Investing in a Distorted World Written by Mark Spitznagel Narrated by Jeremy Arthur Forward In 1971, in the midst of a busy day in my medical practice, I took a long lunch to drive 60 miles to the University of Houston to hear one of the last formal lectures given by the great Austrian school economist Ludwig von Mises. He was 90 at the time, but still as passionate and articulate as ever. Here was the man whose writings had been my main inspiration to absorb and champion Austrian economics, which has dominated my thinking ever since. I had been first introduced to the Austrians while I was a medical student at Duke University and came across a copy of F. A. Hayek's The Road to Serfdom. After that, I spent much of my free time reading everything I could find from the Austrian school. Along with Hayek and Mises, the works of Murray Rothbard and Hans Sinholtz gave me a new view of economics. Before discovering the Austrian school, I did not fully understand the process of how free markets work. The Austrians illustrated for me the benefits of free market economies relative to interventionist, centrally planned economies. The more I read, the clearer it became to me that this was how truly free individuals living in a truly free society should interact with one another. Austrian economists were also arguing for free markets at a time when the majority of intellectuals were praising collectivism and socialism. To this day, I owe the Austrians a debt of gratitude. What I had thought were new ideas about the relationship between economic and personal liberties had, in fact, been around long before I discovered them for myself. Rothbard stated in his work, An Austrian Perspective on the History of Economic Thought, that the ancient Taoists were the world's first libertarians, making Taoism and Austrian economics two bookends, spanning over two millennia in the history of liberal economic and political thought. In The Tao of Capital, my friend and fellow Austrian Mark Spitznagel makes Rothbard's insightful connection a uniquely important theme. More recently, the Austrian school's central principles of private property, free markets, sound money, and liberal society in general can be traced back centuries to classical liberalism, centered on the simplest tenets of all free societies. As economist Ralph Rako wrote, Classical liberalism, which we shall call here simply liberalism, is based on the conception of civil society as, by and large, self-regulating, when its members are free to act within very wide bounds of their individual rights. Among these, the right to private property, including freedom of contract and free disposition of one's own labor, is given a very high priority. Austrian economics is the name given to the school that has often been linked both by adherents and opponents to the liberal doctrine. Over the years, I became closely associated with many friends and students of Mises, and to all of us his example remained paramount. He never attempted to soften his stance nor mute his philosophy to become more acceptable to the conventional economic community. If he had chosen to do so, no doubt he would have received greater recognition during his lifetime. But rather than recognition, his goal was the pursuit of economic truth. Mises was also a gentleman, kind and considerate, and in many ways I have tried to emulate him. I have always turned to Mises' wise words whenever the world, and economists in particular, seemed the most insane. No one should expect that any logical argument or any experience could shake the almost religious fervor of those who believe in salvation through spending and credit expansion. The core of the Austrian school is the unpredictability of human action and the enormous influence individual choice wields in how economics works. It recognizes the subjectivity of value, the role of the entrepreneur, and the pursuit of capital creation to advance society itself. These truths are as essential to grasp today, and perhaps even more so, as they were when the school first emerged in the mid-19th century. In the Tao of Capital, Mark Spitznagel has undertaken a sweeping study of the Austrian school and its correlative thought throughout history. A highly successful investor, Mark brings Austrian economics from the ivory tower to the investment portfolio by demonstrating that its principles of capital, roundabout production, and free markets can and indeed should be applied to entrepreneurial investment. Mark's Austrian investing is fascinating in its clarity and practicality, 
and points out just how difficult it is to go against the grain of interventionism, mainstream economics, and Wall Street culture. As an adherent of the Austrian school, I have been frustrated by constantly being forced to watch what the centralizers and government planners have been doing to our economy, contriving recipe after recipe for disaster. We must understand that markets are naturally resilient. As the Tao of Capital illustrates, without the distorting effects of central planning and interventionism, natural market forces achieve homeostasis on their own, an idea anathema to today's bailout culture. Rather than calming the markets by their actions, central banks create ever-mounting levels of distortion. Grasping at straws, they believe that flooding the world with money will somehow solve the very problems that such interventionalism created in the first place. People deserve better than this. Let capitalism function as it should, without the manipulation of bureaucrats. As a doctor who practiced for a total of nearly 35 years, I abided by the Hippocratic Oath that charged me to do no harm, and not get in the way of the body's natural ability to heal itself. The government must do the same and allow the market's natural homeostatic process to work. This goes to the heart of the message of the Tao of Capital, which shows people how to achieve harmony with the market process, distorted or not. Over the years, deepening my understanding of the significance of free markets helped me see the need to fight for them through political action. Such action can take various forms, from education to revolution. In the United States, it is possible to accomplish necessary change through education, persuasion, and the democratic process. Our rights of free speech, assembly, religion, petition, and privacy remain essentially intact. But before our rights are lost, we must change the policies born of decades of government interventionalism. I always believed deeply that the Founding Fathers got it right certainly more so than their successors, who have worked feverishly against individual rights since the day our Constitution was ratified. Our nation was founded on the value of liberty, and I have never needed to be convinced of the merits of individual freedom. Other forces challenged my natural instincts toward freedom, an education establishment, the media, and government. They constantly preach that we need government to protect us from virtually everything, including ourselves. But I never wavered in my conviction that only an unhampered market is consonant with individual liberty. This liberty goes hand in hand with sound money, a concept that is fundamental to Austrian economics. Mainstream economists continue to downplay or dismiss its importance. The continual and never-ending bad results of these dominant economic experts speak for themselves. Money, according to Mises, must originate in the market as a useful commodity in order to function properly. The most important role money plays is that of a medium of exchange. It also serves as a measurement and store of value. Unfortunately, politicians hold the conviction that money growth gives us economic growth. They are blind to the fact that government cannot create anything. Government cannot make man richer, but it can make him poorer. It is extremely naive to think otherwise. We should all heed the lesson of that which is seen and that which is not seen the keen essay by 19th century economist Friedrich Bastiat, to look beyond the immediate to the less direct results that can and should be foreseen, another of Marx's big themes in the Tao of Capital. The Federal Reserve can intervene in the market and meddle with interest rates, but ultimately cannot escape the immutable nature of free market economics. Politicians may warp a monetary system to their liking, but they cannot repeal economic laws that determine the nature of money. As I have said in the past and stand by today, distortion and corruption through monopoly control can benefit the few at the expense of the many for long periods of time, but eventually the irrefutable laws of nature will win. Free choice in the market is the only way economic calculation can come about. Money had always been viewed as neutral. The supply of money was not thought to play a critical part in determining specific prices. Rather, it was accepted as fact that the price of a product depended only on the supply and the demand of the goods sold. This was tacitly accepted by even the early Austrian economists, but it took Mises to prove the non-neutrality of money, as he wrote in his masterful book, Human Action. As money can never be neutral and stable in purchasing power, a government's plan concerning the determination of the quantity can never be impartial and fair to all members of society. 
Whatever a government does in the pursuit of aims to influence the height of purchasing power depends necessarily upon the ruler's personal value judgments. It always furthers the interests of some groups of peoples at the expense of other groups. It never serves what is called the common weal or the public welfare. To tamper with a nation's money is to tamper with every economic aspect of people's lives, earnings, savings, how much one pays in nominal terms for every purchase made. When money is manipulated at will by politicians, it always leads to chaos, unemployment, and political upheaval. For this reason, it is imperative that we identify a money that cannot be abused, that prohibits inflation, and allows responsible working citizens to prosper. As the Dow of Capital clearly shows, with an inflating fiat currency, capital investment in a market economy becomes very difficult. As money is destroyed, there is an increase in government power and interference in the markets to attempt to maintain order. Government officials throughout history have refused to admit that economic planning does not work until it's too late. And then, when governments have tried to compensate for printing too much money, it has only made things worse. This should sound all too familiar to Americans concerning the functions of the Federal Reserve. Ironically, there is a consensus in America against government price controls in favor of free markets, until it comes to the most important price of all, the price of time or interest rates. This is how the government controls the value of money. Through this price control, the government also distorts the market's elaborate coordinating function between consumers and producers. Thanks to the work of the Austrian economists, we know that the loss of this coordination gives us boom and bust cycles, due solely to the manipulation of the supply of money and credit by the central bank. Therefore, the rate of unemployment and the general standard of living are all a reflection in large part of the monetary policy a nation pursues. Mises understood how money becomes as much a political issue as an economic one. His insights helped me to oppose excuses for deficits coming from both the left and the right. Regardless of their rhetoric, both factions depend on a fiat money system and inflation to continue government financing while serving their respective special interests. The Austrians explain thoroughly why government intervention is the enemy and why individual liberty is key to realizing true freedom. The assurances I gained from these ideas and the example of Mises' character have enabled me to tolerate my time in Washington, D.C. and in Congress. The phrase Austrian economics is not something I ever expected to come into widespread use, but since 2008 it has permeated our political vocabulary at a popular level that continues to thrill me as a longtime student of the Austrian school. Although these teachings have gloomy implications for today, we have much reason to be optimistic, namely the traction and potential gained among the younger generation. It has given me tremendous pride to see the thousands of young people who come to my rallies, a reflection of how the youth of America are embracing freedom, economic and otherwise. To the degree that these principles become even more popular and others discover the economic truths espoused by Mises and his students, including through the Tao of Capital, we will finally be able to put our country on sound financial footing. Freedom is indeed popular, but fully realizing it also means fully embracing Austrian economics. Ron Paul Introduction at the outset, we must think of capital in a new way, as a verb, not a noun. Rather than an inanimate asset or piece of property, it constitutes an action, a means to an end, to build, to advance, to deploy the tools and instruments of a progressing economy. Indeed, capital is a process, or a method or path, what the ancient Chinese called the Tao. Capital has an intertemporal dimension. Its positioning and advantage at different points in the future is central. Time is its milieu, defines it, shapes it, helps it, and hinders it. As we think of capital in a new way, we also must think of time in a new way, as we engage this process, our path, our Tao of capital. This path is notable in that it is exceedingly and purposefully circuitous. The key word throughout this audiobook is roundabout, the going right in order to then go left that leads first to the means, those strategic intermediate waypoints from which it becomes all the more possible and effective to arrive at the ultimate ends. As evident and ubiquitous as this process is all around us, from the natural world of the boreal forest to the business world of the entrepreneur, 
All too often we fail to perceive it. We tend to see the destination, but somehow often miss the path. So we end up playing the wrong game. This is a lesson that runs deep through many areas of life's strategic thinking and decision-making. But this is an audiobook about investing, and as such, this is my focus. Though I hope to make the point clearly in this narration, that investing is an innate human action not distinct from others. Nonetheless, investing is perhaps where the lesson is most acute. The flashing lights of Bloomberg terminals and brokerage screens, with their allure of immediate profits, distract us such that they are all we can see. Unseen are the teleological mechanisms behind what is seen, the engines of the world, as it were, churning away with time. Even Wall Street, that great sideshow with its temporal constraints shackling it to the urgent present, is blind to these mechanisms of the economy and can only chase the shadows of what is actually happening. The good news, however, is that these mechanisms are very simple at their core. Moreover, they have been clearly revealed by a tradition of economic thought known as the Austrian or Viennese School of Economics, named somewhat pejoratively for its birthplace, the cultural and intellectual nexus of the 19th century, where founders Karl Menger and Eugen von Bambavirk established a new way of thinking about capital as roundabout means to more productive ends. Their intellectual progeny, the great Ludwig von Mises, did more to advance the Austrian school than any other, and in whose name the torch is still carried today. The Austrians, though, are not our only forebears. Indeed, in the roundabout we find a pillar of strategic thought that goes back some twenty-five centuries to ancient China and the Taoists, who in their concept of reversion saw everything as emerging from, and as a result of, its opposite, hard from soft, advancing from retreating. From these roots, both Eastern and Western, we learn to intertemporalize across slices of time, never focusing solely on the objective of our desire. In pursuit of circuitous means, we assume a whole depth of fields. The great strategists of the world did not need to be taught to train their attention on the means of their later advantages. Their quintessential roundabout entrepreneur, Henry Ford, knew it in his gut. But as investors, we are completely separated from the means-ends process of production and economic progress, succumbing instead to what seems an endless complexity. Calling to mind the words of Finnish composer Jean Sibelius, Rather than manufacturing cocktails of every hue and description, I hope to offer here the pure cold water of this unadorned archetypal approach. Following the Tao of Capital, we will build new habits of awareness regarding the mechanisms of capital and of capitalistic investing, the means and methodology of the market process itself. By aligning ourselves with these mechanisms, we find an intellectual and, far more importantly, practical discipline I call Austrian investing, which does not directly pursue profits, but rather the roundabout means of profits. When I was first approached by my publisher and finally convinced to write a book, I launched an arduous campaign of introspection and organization, and then eventually writing. The former was pure joy, the latter not at all. I am a professional investor, not a professional writer. In trying to explain and illustrate my central investment methodology, I undertook a circuitous journey that span the coniferous boreal forests, warring states China, Napoleonic Europe, burgeoning industrial America, and, of course, the great economic thinkers of 19th and 20th century Austria. The common thread throughout was always orienting to means, not ends, seeking harmony with the market process, not profits. The result of my endeavors over the past two years, slipped in between, first and foremost, running hedge funds, is the Tao of capital. As a side note, I might observe that the worst thing about having written a book is ever being accused quite literally and fairly of talking your book. While I do describe here in general terms what I practice as an active investor and hedge fund manager, I hope to mitigate some of this first by stating that my partnerships are effectively closed and second by pledging any and all book profits to charity. And think about it. Anyone who writes an investment book and cannot say likewise should, in my view, be largely disregarded. This audiobook offers, eventually, an introduction to Austrian investing. I will marshal data to illustrate the effectiveness of my approach. However, these revelations will occur in the final two chapters of the audiobook. The bulk of my discussion will focus on the all-important thinking behind Austrian investing. It is fitting that I structure the audiobook in this fashion, for as we'll see, the whole point of my approach to investing 
is that we must be willing to adopt the indirect route to achieve our goals. Let me provide an overview of our journey. We began in Chapter 1 with my own introduction to the market process through the careful tutelage of a wise old grain trader at the Chicago Board of Trade, Everett Clipp, whose teachings unknowingly echoed the ancient wisdom of the Taoists, and the seminal book known as the Lao Tzu, or Tao Te Ching. I continue to learn from my recollections of Clippisms to this day. From there we move to the natural world and central pedagogy that builds on nature's strategy and logic of productive and opportunistic growth, the light motif of the conifer that, as we will hear in chapter two, is intergenerationally roundabout. By retreating first to the rocky, inhospitable places where competitors cannot grow, and from there seeds the fertile areas cleared by wildfire. This strategy of the conifers was evident in the canonical military strategists, the original strategic thinkers and decision makers, as we will hear in chapter three, starting with Sun Tzu, or Master Sun, whose often superficially quoted teachings in the Sun Tzu provide us with the core concept of sure, which has multiple meanings but can be thought of as a strategic positional advantage. The same thinking is also found within Von Krieger on war, the often misinterpreted writings of Karl von Clausewitz, who advocated going for the means of key strategic points at which to weaken the enemy and thus better achieve the final objectives of victory and peace more expediently. In Chapter 4, we find roundabout strategic thinking in those who fought ideological battles. Proto-Austrian economist Friedrich Bastiat, who challenged the Marxist and gave us the seen and the foreseen, and Austrian school founder Menger, who took an a priorist stance as he jousted with the German historicists, who held a slavish attachment to empiricism. From Menger we move in Chapter 5 to the man who put the Austrian school on the map, Bambavirk, who gives us insights on the relationship between saving, investment, and capital accumulation, thus providing today's investor with a theoretic understanding of the market process. His capital theories illustrate the roundabout of Produktion Sumweg to amass deeper and increasingly efficient and productive capital structures, as exemplified by Ford, who turned coal and steel into cars for the masses. The difficulty of the roundabout cannot be underestimated, as we will hear in Chapter 6, because of our inherent time preferences and myopic time inconsistencies, which might be summed up here as impatience now, patience later. In the real world, people seem to exhibit a much stronger discount per unit of time in the immediate future compared to the distant future, a phenomenon sometimes called hyperbolic discounting. This feature of the world plays a crucial role in my understanding of asset prices, but here, Bermbavirk was a man ahead of his time, writing on these topics more than a century ago. Because of the quirks of our human eagerness for the immediate reward, we are forewarned that what seems easy and straightforward is deceptively so. The roundabout is in practice a counterintuitive path of acquiring later stage advantage through an earlier stage disadvantage, nearly impossible to follow. As the Lao Tzu says, the bright path seems dim, going forward seems like retreat, the easy way seems hard, the highest virtue seems empty, great talents ripen late. In Chapter 7, the great Mises teaches us that the market is a process, drawing from his insights from the early and mid-twentieth century, when he explained real-world entrepreneurship and the booms and busts of the business cycle. Mises' work centered on the actions of the acting man, reflecting, as Austrian economist Murray Rothbard observed, the primordial fact that human beings have goals and purposes and act to attain them. And this fact is known not tentatively and hesitantly, but absolutely and apodictically. It was Mises' focus on this crucial aspect of social affairs, that humans adopt means to achieve their subjective ends, that guided his interpretation of the market process as well as broader trends in history. Mises argued that without first constructing a solid body of economic understanding, the economic historian would be at a loss when analyzing empirical evidence, seeing spurious relationships everywhere. As we will hear in Chapter 8, the distortion of interventionism short-circuits the natural governors within systems, whether forests or markets, and yet, the forces that return the system to homeostasis persist and will eventually prevail, although reversions will be, almost by definition, extremely messy. Thus, we can view the market process as a grand teleological mechanism, 
which exhibits negative feedback loops as it gropes back toward a natural equilibrium after the central bank distorts its natural movements. Across the span of these eight chapters, we establish the foundation of the Tao of Capital, the roundabout means toward our desired end. Only someone who is willing to defer the immediate objective and read on topics that at first may seem only tenuously related can benefit from the last two chapters and the discussion of capitalistic investment strategies known as Austrian investing. This is new and important territory from an Austrian perspective. The Austrian tradition has confined itself largely to academic analysis of the economy and related policy recommendations, explaining what should be, and more to the point, should not be, done to allow the free and full functioning of the entrepreneurial and market processes. In the last two chapters of this audiobook, we move from government policy to investment practice as we navigate a highly distorted and very real world. I call my approach Austrian investing because it relies so heavily on the insights I have gleaned over the years from these great economists. A primary purpose of this audiobook is to explain their importance to other investors so they too might benefit from the Austrian perspective. Now more than ever, investors need to recognize the distortion in the system which has reached near unprecedented proportions. Unhealthy growth of assets that would not exist without the deadly fertilizer of intervention is creating a tinderbox that will, in the not-so-distant future, erupt in massive wildfire. Given the visible distortion in the equity market, as I will discuss in Chapter 9, we should absolutely expect severe stock market losses to come, quite possibly within the next year or so. That's an easy thing for me to flippantly say, and I spend a significant chunk of this audiobook explaining, among other things, why it is so. This urgency brings a somber yet critical note of warning to this narration. In Austrian Investing 1, Chapter 9, we learn how to gauge the distortion in the system, using a measure I call the Misesian Stationarity Index, after the principles of Mises, to protect ourselves from the distortion by knowing when to stay out of the market and when to stay in or to profit from that distortion by using a sophisticated strategy, alas, well beyond the capability of retail investors, and even many professionals, known as tail hedging. Although I am known for this investment approach, let me tip my hand right now. When it comes to market events, there have been no impactful black swans, the so-called unexpected tail events. What were unseen by most were indeed highly foreseeable. In Austrian Investing 2, Chapter 10, we employ Bombavirkian principles as we pursue roundabout capital structures in which to invest, looking at companies that are not part of the Wall Street shadow play because they exhibit promise, though not immediately surging profits. Austrian investing is an older and more gestalt version of what has come to be known as value investing. Austrian investing not only predates it, but also refines and focuses it. In the epilogue, I sum up the roundabout by homing in on a key ingredient in its arduous pursuit a lesson straight from the boreal forest, Sisu. Besides incorporating Austrian theoretical insights into the nature of the market process, my approach mirrors the Austrian approach to economics itself. Unlike most mainstream economists, who desire to model their own discipline after the pattern of physicists, the Austrians, in the tradition of Mises, do not find much use in curve-fitting and econometric backtesting. If we appreciate the power of Mises' arguments, we will understand that we can't just let the facts speak for themselves when it comes to understanding economic phenomena, such as the business cycle, particularly in trying to predict the movements of stock prices. We need an antecedent theory to guide us, to pick out which facts are relevant and which can safely be ignored, to focus only on what matters. After our logical deductions lead us to an investment philosophy, we can, of course, use empirical investigation to check our work and indeed we will do so. In the Tao of Capital, I invite you into my process, not with a plug-and-play strategy, but more importantly, with a way of thinking that can be applied to investing and, indeed, many other important activities in life, in which one must choose wisely across slices of time, so as not to jeopardize or bankrupt opportunities, often better ones that arise later. Without the thinking, though, the acting is baseless. The reasoning is paramount, first and foremost. When I was a young trader starting out in the pit, in fact, the bond pits is youngest, Clip made sure I understood why I was at the Chicago Board of Trade, which was not to learn how to make money, as I relate in Chapter 1. 
If that were the case, he told me, you wouldn't even be in here. You'd be in a long line all the way down LaSalle Street, still waiting to get in. And so I say the same to you. If there were a book that could teach you how to make money, you would be at the end of a long line down the street from any bookstore, what few still exist. The intention of this audiobook is to teach you how to think and provide you with the discipline of the roundabout. Like learning as an adult to swing a golf club or to ski, the intention is to understand the underlying mechanisms in order to coordinate our actions with them. With that foundation, you can engage in the necessary circuitous aspects required by this strategy and the intimately related roundabout process of capital. If and when we lose our way, we reorient ourselves with our Austrian compass that leads us right to go left, along a circuitous path as old as strategic thought itself. In the words of the Lao Tzu, a journey of a thousand miles starts under one's feet, and so we begin with our first step along the Tao of Capital. Mark Spitznagel, North Point, Michigan, July 2013 Chapter 1. The Taoist Sage. Clips Paradox. You've got to love to lose money, hate to make money, love to lose money, hate to make money. But we are human beings. We love to make money, hate to lose money. So we must overcome that humanness about us. This is Clips Paradox, repeated countless times by a sage old Chicago grain trader named Everett Clip and through which I first happened upon an archetypal investment approach, one that I would quickly make my own. This is the roundabout approach, what we will later call Schur and Umweg, and ultimately Austrian investing, indeed central to the very message of this audiobook. Rather than pursue the direct route of immediate gain, we will seek the difficult and roundabout route of immediate loss, an intermediate step which begets an advantage for greater potential gain. This is the age-old strategy of the military general and of the entrepreneur, of the destroyer and of the very creator of civilizations. It is, in fact, the logic of organic efficacious growth in our world. But when it is hastened or forced, it is ruined. Because of its difficulty, it will remain the circuitous road least traveled, so contrary to our wiring, to our perception of time, and virtually impossible on Wall Street. And this is why it is ultimately so effective. Yet it is well within the capability of investors who are willing to change their thinking, to overcome that humanness about them and follow the Tao of capital. How do we resolve this paradox? How is it that the detour could be somehow more effective than the direct route, that going right could be somehow the most effective way to go left? Is this merely meant to confuse, empty words meant to sound wise? Or does it conceal some universal truth? The answers demand a deep reconsideration of time and how we perceive it. We must change dimensions from the immediate to the intermediate, from the atemporal to the intertemporal. It requires a resolute, forward-looking orientation away from what is happening now, what can be seen, to what is to come, what cannot yet be seen. I will call this new perspective our depth of field, using the optics term in the temporal rather than the spatial our ability to sharply perceive a long span of forward movements. This is not about a shift in thinking from the short term to the long term, as some might suppose. Long term is something of a cliché, and often even internally inconsistent. Acting for the long term generally entails an immediate commitment, based on an immediate view of the available opportunity set, and waiting an extended period of time for the result often without due consideration to or differentiation between intertemporal opportunities that may emerge during that extended period of time. Moreover, saying that one is acting long-term is very often a rationalization used to justify something that is currently not working out as planned. Long-term is telescopic, short-term is myopic, depth of field retains focus between the two. So let's not think long-term or short-term, as Clip's paradox requires, Let's think of time entirely differently, as intertemporal, comprised of a series of coordinated now moments, each providing for the next, one after the other, like a great piece of music or beads on a string. We can further peel away Clip's paradox to reveal a deeper paradox, at the very core of much of humanity's most seminal thought. Although Clip did not know it, 
His paradox reached back in time more than two and a half millennia to a far distant age and culture as the essential theme of the Lao Tzu, known later as the Tao Te Ching, but I will refer to it by its original title after its purported author, an ancient political and military treatise, and the original text and summa of the Chinese philosophy of Taoism. To the Lao Tzu, the best path to anything lay through its opposite. One gains by losing and loses by gaining. Victory comes not from waging the one decisive battle, but from the roundabout approach of waiting and preparing now in order to gain a greater advantage later. The Lao Tzu professes a fundamental and universal process of succession and alternation between poles. Between imbalance and balance, within every condition lies its opposite. This is what is called the subtle within what is evident. The soft and weak vanquish the hard and strong. To both Clip and the Lao Tzu, time is not exogenous, but is an endogenous primary factor of things, and patience the most precious treasure. Indeed, Clip was the Taoist sage, with a simple archetypal message that encapsulated how he survived and thrived for more than five decades in the perilous futures markets of the Chicago Board of Trade. The Old Master Taoism emerged in ancient China during a time of heavy conflict and upheaval. Nearly two centuries of warfare, from 403 to 221 BCE, known as the Warring States Period, when the central Chinese plains became killing fields awash in blood and tears. This was also a time of advancement in military techniques, strategy, and technology, such as efficient troop formations and the introduction of the cavalry and the standard-issue crossbow. With these new tools, armies breached walled cities and stormed over borders. War and death became a way of life. Entire cities were often wiped out even after surrender and mothers who gave birth to sons never expected them to reach adulthood. The Warring States period was also a formative phase in ancient Chinese civilization when philosophical diversity flourished. What the Taoist scholar Zheng Zhu termed the doctrines of the hundred schools. From this fertile age sprung illustrious Taoist texts such as the Lao Tzu and the Sun Tzu, the former the most recognized from ancient China and one of the best known throughout the world today. Its attributed author, translated as Master Lao, or the Old Master, may or may not have even existed, and may have been one person, or even a succession of contributors over time. According to tradition, Lao Tzu was the keeper of archival records for the ruling dynasty in the 6th century BCE, although some scholars and sinologists maintain that the Old Master emanated from the 4th century BCE. We know from legend that he was considered to have been a senior contemporary of Kong Su, Confucius, who lived from 551 to 479 BCE, and who was said to have consulted Lao Tzu, and despite being ridiculed by Lao Tzu as arrogant, praised him as a dragon riding on the winds and clouds. Furthermore, written forms of the Lao Tzu, which scribes put down on bamboo scrolls, mostly for military strategists who advised feuding warlords are likely to have been derivatives of an earlier oral tradition, as most of it is rhymed. Whether truth or legend, flesh and bones or quintessential myth, one person or many over time, the old master relinquished an enduring, timeless, and universal wisdom. To most people, it seems, the Lao Tzu is an overwhelmingly religious and even mystical text, and this interpretive bias has perhaps done it a disservice. In fact, the term Laoism has been used historically to distinguish the philosophical Lao Tzu from the later religious Taoism. Recently, new and important translations have emerged, following the unearthing of archaeological finds at Maungdui in 1973 and Guadian in 1993, which amounted to strips of silk and fragments of bamboo scrolls, providing evidence of its origins as a philosophical text, not mystical, but eminently practical. And this practicality relates particularly to strategies of conflict, specifically political and military, the themes of its day, a way of gaining advantage without coercion or the always decisive head-on clash of opposing forces. The Tao of capital stays true to these roots. The Lao Tzu, composed of only 5,000 Chinese characters and 81 chapters as short as verses, outlines the Tao, the way, path, method, or mode of doing a thing, or process toward harmony with the nature of things, with awareness of every step along the way. 
Sinologists Roger Ames and David Hall describe the Tao as waymaking, processional, what they call the gerundive, an intertemporal focal awareness and field awareness, a depth of field, by which we exploit the potential that lies within configurations, circumstances, and systems. The central concept permeating the Lao Tzu is referred therein as Wu Wei, which translates literally as not doing, but means so much more, rather than passivity, a common misperception. Wu Wei means non-coercive action, and here we see the overwhelming laissez-faire, libertarian, even anarchistic origins in the Lao Tzu, thought by some to be the very first in world history, as in one should govern a country as one would fry a small fish, leave them alone and do not meddle with their affairs. A cardinal Lao Tzu political credo most notably invoked in a State of the Union address by President Ronald Reagan. The Lao Tzu also has been deemed a distinctive form of teleology, one that emphasizes the individual's self-development free from the intervention of any external force. This leads to the paradox of what has come to be known as Wei Wu Wei, literally doing not doing, or better yet, doing by not doing, or do without a do. One loses and again loses, to the point that one does everything non-coercively, Wu Wei. One does things non-coercively, and yet nothing goes undone. In Wu Wei is the importance of waiting on an objective process, of suffering through loss for intertemporal opportunities. From the Lao Tzu, who can wait quietly while the mud settles? Who can remain still until the moment of action? It appears as a lesson in humility and tolerance, but as we wait, we willingly sacrifice the first step for a greater, later step. In its highest form, the whole point of waiting is to gain an advantage. Therefore, the apparent humility implied in the process is really a false humility that cloaks the art of manipulation. As French sinologist Francois Julian noted, the sage merges with the manipulator, who, in Taoist terms, humbles himself to be in a better position to rise. If he withdraws, he does so to be all the more certainly pulled forward. If he ostensibly drains away his self, he does so to impose that self all the more imperiously in the future. This is the efficacy of circumvention camouflaged as suppleness. And in this temporal configuration is, in the words of Ames and Hall, the Lao Tzu's correlative relationship among antimonies. With false humility, we deliberately become soft and weak now in order to be hard and strong later. The very reason that, in the Lao Tzu, those who are good at vanquishing their enemies do not join issue. In this sense, the Lao Tzu can simply be seen as a manual on gaining advantage through indirection, or turning the force of an opponent against him, through excess leading to its opposite. The soft and weak vanquish the hard and strong. Perhaps the most tangible representation of Wu Wei can be seen in the interplay of softness and hardness in the Chinese martial art Taiji Chuan, not surprising as it is a direct derivative of the Lao Tzu. According to legend, Taiji Chuang was created by a 13th century Taoist priest, Zhang Sanfeng. Cloistered on Wudang Mountain, he observed a clash between a magpie and a serpent and suddenly fully grasped the Taoist truth of softness overcoming hardness. The serpent moved with, indeed, complimented the magpie, and thus avoided its repeated decisive attacks, allowing the snake to wait for and finally exploit an opening, an imbalance with a lethal bite to the bird. In this sequential patience, retreating in order to eventually strike, was the Lao Tzu's profound and unconventional military art. There is a saying among soldiers, I dare not make the first move, but would rather play the guest. I dare not advance an inch, but would rather withdraw a foot. This is called marching without appearing to move, rolling up your sleeves without showing your arm, capturing the enemy without attacking, being armed without weapons. Like Taoism itself, Tai Chi Chuan has drifted into the more mystical and new age, but its roots remain in its martial application. This is clear today in the powerful blows of the original Chen-style Tai Chi Chuan form, as still practice in Chen Village, located in Henan Province in central China. According to Chen Xin, among the lineage of the eponymous Chen clan, in his seminal canon of Chen family Tai Chi Quan, a deceptive rotational and circular force known as silk reeling is the main objective of Tai Chi Quan moves, which work on the centrifugal principles of a roundabout. The rotation is between retreating and advancing, between soft and hard. 
When performed by a master, such as my teachers Qi Cheng Guo and Jing Ming Yang, of whose Qi Na maneuvers I have oft found myself on the wrong end, it is most unsettling, almost deplorable in its artful deceitfulness. Tai Chi Quan is a physical manifestation of the importance of waiting and exploiting another's urgency through softness in a clash. This is most apparent in the two-person Tai Chi Quan competitive exercise known as Tui Shou, or Push Hands, in which two opponents engage in what looks to the casual observer like a choreographed series of synchronized movements. In actuality, Tui Shou is a cunning contest with highly constrained rules in which each tries to throw the other to the ground or outside a boundary during a sequence of subtle alternating feints and attacks. The real force is not in the pushing, but in the yielding. In Tui Shou is an ideal roundabout and investing metaphor, one that I will return to again and again. The Song of Push Hands, in its oral transfer of the art over centuries in Chen Village, instructs the competitor to guide the opponent's power into emptiness, then immediately attack. To guide or lure the opponent into emptiness, and thus destroy his balance, is the very indirect objective, to gain the position of advantage, to be followed by the direct objective of attack. This is the essential Tui Shou sequence of yielding, neutralizing, and sticking, Yielding and neutralizing, Zou, or Zou Hua, leading by walking away, is the sneaky retreating route, followed by converting and redirecting a force to advantage. That advantage is exploited by sticking and following, Nyan, or Nyan Sui, and thus eventually advancing back in a decisive counterattack. Taken together, as we will hear in Chapter 3, this sequence describes Shi, the strategy of Wu Wei. The competition is a subtle interplay of delusive complementary, not opposing forces between opponents, between hard and soft, each seeking the shrewd strategy of patiently attacking the balance rather than the force, of going right in order to ultimately go decisively left. This is also the insidious strategy of guerrilla warfare. While used effectively, for instance, by the scrappy American colonists against the British in the 18th century, it was later used deftly against the mighty United States by the far weaker and smaller Viet Cong in the 20th century. The very same alternating intertemporal softness and hardness. When the U.S. troops surged, the Viet Cong retreated in a rout into the mountains, Zhou Hua, drawing the U.S. troops out until overextended. Then the Viet Cong counterattacked, following the U.S. troops, Nian, in a destructive counter-rout. The great frustration, the unfairness, is that the harder you push, the harder you fall. Chairman Mao knew these words from the Lao Tzu. If a small country submits to a great country, it can conquer the great country. Therefore, those who would conquer must yield, and those who conquer do so because they yield. We will encounter this again with the guerrilla warriors of the North in the epilogue. In the Wu Wei of Tai Ji Quan, the advantage comes not from applying force but from circular yielding, from directing the course of events rather than forcing them from the Lao Tzu. Hence an unyielding army is destroyed, an unyielding tree breaks. The patience of the intermediate steps of loss and advantage defeats the impatience of the immediate gain. The direct force is defeated by the counterforce. Thus there are always two games being played in time, one now and one later, against two different opponents. As the great Tui Shao practitioner Jing Man Ching observed, one must first learn to invest in loss by leading an opponent's force away so that it is useless and which will polarize into its opposite and be transformed into the greatest profit. In Tai Ji Quan is the essence of the Tao of Capital. So much of waiting and ignoring present circumstances, of willingness to be in an uncomfortable place, is understanding the sequential instead of only seeing the immediate. There is a definite brand of epistemology at the root of the Lao Tzu. To the Lao Tzu, much of the exterior world is but exterior diversion. Much perception is a distraction from a hidden reality, though one which requires diligent attention. It states this most succinctly and venture not beyond your doors to know the world. Peer not outside your window to know the way-making. The farther one goes, the less one knows. Paul Karras, in his definitive 1913 The Canon of Reason and Virtue, being Lao Tzu's Tao Te King, when so far as to relate this epistemology of the Lao Tzu to 18th century German philosopher Immanuel Kant, the Lao Tzu endorses Kant's doctrine of the a priori, 
which means that certain truths can be stated a priori, viz. even before we make an actual experience. It is not the globetrotter who knows mankind, but the thinker. In order to know the sun's chemical composition, we need not go to the sun. We can analyze the sun's light by spectrum analysis. We need not stretch a tape line to the moon to measure its distance from the earth. We can calculate it by the methods of an a priori science, trigonometry. Indeed, there is an almost anti-empirical vein to the Lao Tzu, a stand against the positivist view of knowledge as exclusively flowing from sense perceptions. As Jacob Needleman interprets the Lao Tzu, we see only things, entities, events. We do not directly experience the forces and laws that govern nature. Similarly, Ellen Chen says the Lao Tzu is not pro-science in spirit. Repudiating the knowledge of the many is not conducive to the knowledge of the one thus invalidating induction. Truth is learned from understanding basic natural and logical constrictions. A tree that bends to the force of a wind, pent up water that eventually destroys all in its path. The interplay between snake and bird. There is much deception in appearance, the tyranny of the senses, of empirical data, wisdom that gains particular context and meaning in investing. Into the Pit my exposure to investing came quite by accident. As a 16-year-old, whose only previous experience with markets was through a share in the Rochester Red Wings minor league baseball team, passed down proudly for three generations, I tagged along with my father when he paid a visit to his good friend and corn futures trader, whatever that was, Everett Clip at the Chicago Board of Trade. I stood in the visitor's gallery, overlooking the grain trading pits, gaining a bird's-eye view over a kaleidoscope of bright trading jackets, flailing arms, and lurching bodies. I was expecting some kind of swanky casino, perhaps out of a James Bond film. But this was different than that. I was mesmerized. It reminded me of watching a flock of birds, a cloud of countless individual parts, appearing as a single fuzzy organism, seemingly resting, hovering in midair, until something unseen starts to ripple through it like a pulse of energy causing a sudden jolting turn in a burst of speed. The flock swoops and dives, rests, and then rises again, with a mechanical yet organic coordination and precision, while the outside observer can only marvel at its driver. In the pit was the same mystery, with pauses interrupted by sudden cascades of noise and energy driven by something imperceptible. It was a financial Sturm und Drang, but within it, was an unmistakable, intricate communication and synchronization. In an instant I scrapped my hard-won Juilliard plans. Needless to say, my mother was horrified, and wanted nothing more than to be a pit trader. After that fateful trip, I became obsessed with the grain futures markets. Price charts soon lined my bedroom walls, and I constructed a potted corn and soybean plant laboratory, with seedlings lifted from local farms in the dark of night, for monitoring rainfall and crop progress. From then on, whenever I would see Clip, I always peppered him with questions, often with handy graphs and USDA reports in tow, on price trends, world grain supplies, Soviet demand, Midwest weather patterns, basically on where the markets were headed. His response was always a variation on, the market is a completely subjective thing, it can do anything, and it is always right, yet always wrong. His abject disdain for data and information left me bemused, even skeptical of this stubborn old Chicago grain man with the gravelly voice, ever speaking in fortune cookie prose. How could he have done so well as a speculator without knowing or even caring where the market was heading? How could it be that guys who know where the market is heading are no longer at the board of trade? They are either retired or broke, and I can't think of any that are retired. Classic Clip if trading wasn't about predicting price movements, then what was it all about? After all, profiting was buying or selling at one price and then eventually selling or buying it back at a higher or lower price. How could this be done without any ability to forecast? The answer, which took this teenager some time to understand, was that the edge to pit trading was in the order flow, the succession of many routes, as I always called them, and in the discipline, it was in a patient response to someone else's impatience, someone else's urgency. The edge was a process, an intertemporal process, an intermediate step to gain an advantage, rather than any direct analytical acumen or information. And its monetization, its roundabout production, required time. 
The bond pit was where the real action was, and where the average trader's age was perhaps twenty to thirty years below that in the corn pit. When it came time to ask Clip what to study in college to best prepare me for a career in the bond pit, he advised, anything that won't make you think you know too much. Alas, my economics major would have to remain a dirty secret. During summers and over holiday breaks from college, where I can recall always carrying around a copy of the book The Treasury Bond Basis, still stubbornly trying to ready myself for trading, I worked as a lowly clerk for a few of Clip's traders. Finally, after graduating, with backing from Grandma Spitznagel, my first and best investor, I leased a membership at the Chicago Board of Trade and took my place in the bond pit where, at age 22, I became its youngest trader. The deliverable instrument of the bond futures contract is the 30-year U.S. Treasury bond, or a nearby cheapest to deliver. The benchmark interest rate, along with the 10-year, on which long-term debt is based. In the early 1990s, the bond futures pit was the center of the financial universe, the most actively traded contract and the locus of open outcry in all the world. The pit was where anyone with long-term dollar-denominated interest rate risk in the future converged to hedge their rates. Whether savers worried about forward rates falling or borrowers concerned about forward rates rising. Trading pits are configured like concentric rings, octagons actually, that descend like a staircase, resembling an inverted tiered wedding cake. The very top, outer step of the bond pit was occupied by the biggest and baddest traders, as this was where the biggest brokers with the biggest order flow stood, as well as where the best sight lines were into the pit, an incalculable advantage. In my first month, I was decidedly not there. In fact, I was at the other extreme, at the very bottom of the pit, where only the back month contracts sporadically traded. For the first month or so, my day started and ended with Clip standing next to me, feeding me trades and testing to see how I managed them. Clip made it perfectly clear. You're not here to make money. You're here to learn how to trade. If you could walk into the pit to make money, you wouldn't even be in here. You'd be in a long line all the way down LaSalle Street, still waiting to get in. This was an imminently roundabout start down a roundabout path. The Privileges of a Trader Clip's methodology was exceedingly simple, almost dubiously so, conveyed as a parent would to a child, not as principles, but as privileges. As a pit trader, you have two privileges and two privileges only. One, you can demand the edge, buy at the bid price, sell at offer price. Two, you can give up that edge when you've made a mistake. The edge of Clip's allotted privileges is that of the market makers, known as locals at the Chicago Board of Trade. The bond pit was occupied by both locals, virtually all of whom, like me, traded independently for their own accounts, and brokers whose job was to execute orders on their clients' behalf. What locals do is provide immediacy to those who demand it, meaning they offer prices, a bid price and an ask price, at which they are willing to transact immediately, and in so doing they provide immediate liquidity. In exchange, the locals require a price concession, reflected in their bid and ask prices, a profit they expect to monetize as demands for immediacy flow in from both sides, from buyers as well as sellers. Locals stand in the pit all day waiting for that flow, specifically to trade against an impatient counterparty. It's not up to the locals to determine when they trade, rather they wait, and if necessary, wait some more. The price concessions, the rents extracted from urgent counterparties, who pay for not having to wait, are the locals' ultimate edge. But, upon receiving such a price concession, the locals' game is not over. He has the advantage, but he must act yet again, either by stepping aside, taking his loss, or following the market back. He accumulates inventory, a position, by transacting against urgent order flow, with the intention of closing out of that inventory profitably once the urgency subsides. Thus, advancing seems to be receding, and the local advances by retreating. But naturally, between these two steps is the potential for great loss, the cost of waiting and holding inventory. So the sooner he gets out, the better. But in so doing, his aim is to transact better than his urgent counterparty, from whom he received his position in the first place. The late legendary Bond local Charlie D. Francesca, Charlie D., put it best. The question is, can you be more efficient than the market? Clip liked to think about the local's role in more standard business terms, 
such as the inventory markup of the wholesaler or the retailer, or more generally, the price spreads that exist in different phases of production for any economic good, including futures contracts. Both involve exploiting intertemporal balances between raw material and output, providing immediacy to end users and the intermediation of waiting, carrying intermediate inventory, including capital goods and other factors of production, and providing a final good at just the right time and place. And as we will hear in Chapter 5, the more roundabout this process, typically the greater these spreads. The second allotted privilege was cruel, as Clip would say, because it meant immediately closing out a trade once it turned negative, a mistake, what he called always taking a one-tick loss. One could expect this to happen roughly half of the time, and much of the other half of the time, depending, of course, on how quickly any profits were grabbed, as we'll discuss, the price would find its way back to show a loss, even then as well. For instance, if the market was three bid, four offered, meaning 115 and 23 30 seconds bid, offered at 115 and 24 30 second, I had to buy at three or sell at four, demand the edge without exception. If I managed to buy a one lot or one contract at three, and then a big sell order came in and pushed the market down one tick to two bid, three offered. I was expected to immediately sell that one lot to someone at two, give up the edge or step out, preferably to a broker who would later return the favor, thus taking my one tick loss, which amounted to $31.25 on one $100,000 bond contract. I was officially in Clip's Alpha School of Trading, as everyone called it, after the name of his firm, Alpha Futures. We were the guys in the aqua jackets who loved to lose money. Who could argue with this logic? If, as Clip said, there's only one thing that can hurt a trader at the Chicago Board of Trade, and that's a big loss, then for God's sake, never take a big loss. As his own mentor said to him some forty years before, any time you can take a loss, do it, and you will always be at the Chicago Board of Trade. To which Clip always added with a smile, well, I've been losing money since 1954, but he was right. I'm still at the Chicago Board of Trade. Naturally, this meant taking many small losses. Hence, you had to love to lose money. Otherwise, you'd just stop doing it. Impatience and intolerance for many such small losses, as well as urgency for immediate profits, Clip believed, dealt a death blow to traders, an easy and common one. The well-known disposition effect in finance, an observation that goes back at least a century, states that people naturally fall victim to these tendencies and thus do the opposite of Clip's approach. We sweat through large losses and take small profits quickly. Going for the immediate gain feels so right, while taking the immediate loss feels so wrong. The pressing need for consistent and immediate profits is hardwired into our brains. We humans have a shallow depth of field, as we will hear in Chapter 6. And nothing is better at amplifying this natural humanness about us than trading too big and having excessive carrying costs. These are the great external magnifying lenses on the immediate. All is decisive when all is at stake, whether through an excessive loss because of too much leverage, a loss that you can't afford to take immediately, or an insufficient gain because of too much debt. No one trade need ever be decisive. As Clip said, one trade can ruin your day. One trade can ruin your week. One trade can ruin your month. One trade can ruin your year. One trade can ruin your career. It is not surprising, then, that Clip's approach was not embraced by everyone, even by most, in fact. In many ways, he was Pitt Trading's greatest dissident. Despite his title, bestowed by the futures industry of the Babe Ruth of the Chicago Board of Trade, among his greatest critics was none other than Charlie D., the misinterpretation of whose criticism surely cost many an aspiring Charlie D. his shirt. There will only ever be one Charlie D., it was nearly impossible to follow and practice consistently. Brutal was Clip's term to describe the formidable challenge of looking beyond the immediate outcome, of retaining depth of field, a challenge that Clip believed was essential to gaining an edge. This was as it should be. Indeed, if everyone accepted Clip's paradox, it would no longer be effective, no longer even be a paradox. From the Lao Tzu, the bright path seems dim. Going forward seems like retreat. The easy way seems hard. The highest virtue seems empty. Here are the favorite Taoist images of water in the valley, the Lao Tzu's attitude of lowliness, which water always seeks. 
This was Clip's roundabout approach, and that of his mentor and perhaps his before. Expect to lose first. The first loss is a good loss. From that comes greater gain later. Call it playing good defense, embracing loss, biding one's time and using the present moment for later advantage, the advantage of then playing more effective offense. Or as Clip called it, looking like a jerk, feeling like a jerk. Waiting must precede opportune action by definition. Exploiting others' immediacy was the logic of the roundabout approach, the fundamental edge, the ultimate edge of trading and investing. In baseball, the difference between minor leaguer and major leaguer is generally thought to be in hitting the curveball, as opposed to just a linearly extrapolated fastball. And so too is the difference in investing in playing the curve, the roundabout intertemporal bends which deviate from the straight course. My mantra has always been like that of Milwaukee Braves pitcher Lou Burdett, who once said, I earn my living from the hungriness of hitters. I earn my living from the hungriness of investors, from their decisiveness, their forcefulness, from their great urge for immediacy. And this immediacy was not just the bid-ask spread. It was even more so, as we will hear in the larger routes. Robinson Crusoe in the Bond Pit After about a month, Clip released me into the wilds of the active bond contract, the upper steps. The discipline had to remain the same. I still had but two privileges, and like a hawk, he kept an eye on me in the pit, as well as on my daily trading statements, to make sure that it did. The king of the bond pit, nay, of all pits, was, and will forever be, Lucian Thomas Baldwin III, trading badge BAL, known for the largest trading size of any local, thousands of contracts a day and his ability to single-handedly bully what was then the half-trillion-dollar government bond market. While I was still a teenager at a time when most in Chicago idolized MJ, I idolized BAL. As a clerk in the pit, I intently studied his trading. He was a man possessed, which perhaps explained his unfortunate and notorious pencil-stabbing pit incident. But what was so astounding about him was his disciplined control in alternating between tremendous patience and overwhelming aggression. So naturally, I had to pick a spot in the pit near BALs. He took one look at my fresh face and SIZ trading badge and branded me forever the Sizzler and made me his personal spitball target. But if I had to be hazed during my start as a pit trader, I was honored that it was by the greatest of all time, and it was something of a rite of passage when he stopped lobbing spitballs and started trading with me. Venturing into the upper steps of the bond pit, was like suddenly getting shipwrecked on a deserted island, all alone and with little access to order flow. I was the Robinson Crusoe of the bond pit. This apt metaphor, the solitary islander who devises a range of strategies for survival amid scarcity, the protagonist of Daniel Defoe's 1719 novel, runs deeper. It has become a quintessential economic parable, used most notably by the Austrian school economists who focused so much on the actions of the individual in exchanging one state of affairs for another, what they called autistic exchange, but going back at least as far as Adam Smith himself. Crusoe's simple act of making a crude fishing pole and later sacrificing the time to construct a boat and net, tools by which he becomes more productive, will become integral to our roundabout concept in Chapter 5. Clip had given me the equivalent of a pole with which to catch fish, but that was it. I endlessly cast my meager solitary line, bidding and offering one lots, but cast after cast, more often than not the result was yet another one-tick loss. The fish stole the bait. Days sometimes passed with little to show for time spent standing and yelling in the pit. Then I would hook a meal for a week. Now let's say Robinson Crusoe discovers, after exploring various fishing holes around his lonely island home, that at some, perhaps where the water is rather shallow, he can catch smaller fish with some frequency, and he has also discovered a few spots, perhaps where the water is very deep, where the fish are much larger, but fewer in number, and thus bite much less frequently. There is a natural trade-off for Crusoe, then between size and frequency. This is, of course, a ubiquitous trade-off in nature, and when involving complex phenomena, is often described in terms of a power law of frequency along the size continuum, or really small things are really common, really big things less so. The question was, where should Crusoe fish, or in the trading pit, how big of a profit was I after, when to grab a winner? 
Answering this question was necessary to the second step in the roundabout process of pit trading. While Clip's methodology, his privileges, defined the edge and the downside of monetizing that edge, it left wide open the size of the profit to wait for. He explained the size of a good loss, but said nothing about the size of a good profit. He would always say, while there's no such thing as taking a loss too quick, you can take a profit too quick, but I can't tell you when to take a profit. The term scalper typically meant a local looking to make one tick on every trade. Clip was the anti-scalper. With Clip, there was no settling for minnows. The question of profit size was, of course, not about trade size, which was a simple function of account size, and which, of course, would impact both losses and gains proportionately. This was about the size of profits relative to the size of losses, the payoff. In Clip's basic asymmetric strategy, the bigger the gain I waited for, the less frequently it would occur, and the more asymmetric or positively skewed my payoff would be. For example, taking profits only after they reached 10 ticks in my favor would naturally happen less frequently and would be accompanied by more frequent losses than after just three ticks. I would often watch a profit of seven, eight, nine ticks come right back and become a one-tick loss. Not fun. This could be extended to the absurd. I could shoot for hundreds of ticks, which might not happen for many years, perhaps never at all, with nothing but countless one-tick losses until then. On its own, a very potent strategy, but not necessarily very effective in the end. While Clip was not a scalper, neither was his approach about hitting the jackpot on one lucky trade. It was about incremental gains, exploiting a systematic edge through time. But indeed, as the profit objective increased, the trade became the equivalent of holding a basket of long option positions, or convex payoffs. Clip had an intuitive understanding that the market tended to experience infrequent large moves, what we call fat tails, for mass in the extremes of the frequency distribution of market returns, and that replicating such a basket in its simplest and most elegant form was a good way to play it. Fishing in McGilligot's Pool As I experimented with moving from small fish to big, with decreasing frequency, I moved from the world of Defoe to that of another literary economic thinker, Theodore Geisel, otherwise known as Dr. Seuss. In his 1947 book, McGilligot's Pool, a young boy coincidentally named Marco imagines all sorts of wondrous fish that he can't see beneath a murky pond, but intends to catch nonetheless. A disparaging old farmer repeatedly tells him that there are no fish in the pond, but Marco keeps trying. He casts and casts, undeterred. Marco's bet illustrates rather aptly the 2nd and 3rd century CE skeptic Sextus Empiricus's problem of induction, i.e. the black swan problem. All it would take would be one fish to prove that cynical old inductivist farmer wrong. Marco says defiantly, It may be you're right. I've been here three hours, without one single bite. There might be no fish. But again, well, there might. Although Marco can't see anything in that pond, and no one has ever caught anything there before, he patiently hopes to exploit the extreme unknown that he dreams up, described in Seussian rhyme, something bigger, some sort of a kind of a thingamajigger, a fish that's so big, if you know what I mean, that he makes a whale look like a tiny sardine. As a young pit trader, ever squeezing my profits indeed, I was Marco, waiting for the big unknown trophy. It turned out to be a rather productive approach for me, particularly from the limit-downed bond collapse of 1994. And such asymmetrical casting is a useful idea when the waters are murky, when you don't know anything, and you don't even know what you don't know. But it seemed to be conflating two edges, one systematic and one fuzzy, the local's edge and some kind of presumed underpriced tendency for large deviations. These were really very much the same, though on different scales. Indeed, all moves in the market, big and small, ultimately have immediacy at their source. Enter the Austrians. A von Karajan moment. Clip was convinced that nothing from academia would be useful in the real gritty world of financial markets, but he was unaware of a particular old school of economic thought, where hidden within its formalized foundation was the very same foundation, not only for his alpha school, but more broadly for a rigorous investment methodology predating and rivaling all others. 
though locked away by decades of neglect and never drawn out and applied. This was the great Austrian school of economics, or the Vienna School, named after the origin of its founders, by most accounts non-existent amid the vast majority of academic economic programs. And what better indication of the precedence of credentials over understanding the world in modern academia? So, Clip was perhaps right in his expectation, as my collegiate exposure to the Austrians was truly the luckiest of breaks. It started in a fortuitous economics course at Georgetown University, taught by Professor George Vixnens, Uncle George. It is most fitting to gain the greatest insight about markets from those who fled anti-market regimes, in his case in Latvia. Uncle George's declared favorite economist was Josef Schumpeter, a wavering Austrian to be sure, but close enough to pique my interest. And from there I discovered a book by Henry Hazlitt, titled Economics in One Lesson, and if I am able to get my children to read only one economics text in their lifetime, God forbid, it would be Hazlitt's. In addition to the Austrian tradition's absence from most of the top universities, it should come as no surprise that, according to my diligent research, even Austrian-friendly texts are absent from virtually all the top preparatory schools in the United States, but for one, my favorite, Cranbrook Kingswood in Michigan, where Hazlitt's book is required reading. Economics in One Lesson is an expansion on the essay, That Which is Seen and That Which is Not Seen, by 19th-century French economist Friedrich Bastiat, who plays a leading role in Chapter 4 of this audiobook. Hazlitt's proclamation would become a central tenet for me, wherein I would equivalently swap the words economics with investing and act or policy with capital and production process. The whole of economics can be reduced to a single lesson, and that lesson can be reduced to a single sentence. The art of economics consists in looking not merely at the immediate, but at the longer effects of any act or policy. I could not put Hazlitt's book down, and it would even replace my dog-eared treasury bond basis. The closing verse of Hazlitt's book was an auspicious directive. The reader who aims at a thorough understanding and feels prepared for it should next read Human Action by Ludwig von Mises. Finally, as a pit trader, I got around to complying. So there I was trading in the bond pit, likely the most competitive capital marketplace in the world, and being lectured to on my daily commute by its greatest acolyte, by way of the cassette version of Human Action. Human Action is the Lao Tzu of the Austrian school, the magnum opus of its central figure, a monumental economics treatise from 1949, which Mises wrote in English, but which was based on his 1940 German language, Nationalökonomie, Theorie des Handelns und Wirtschaftens. Mises is another case, like Uncle George, of one who evaded the destructive suppression of free markets, among other liberties, in his case the 1938 Nazi Anschluss in Austria. In Mises' words, in his method, I instantly detected something unmistakably familiar, almost as if I'd heard them before. Hidden within this massive, dense, and formal work was the simplicity of Clip's paradox, the simplicity and elegance of the Lao Tzu, yet articulated in a way that resolved it. It was a von Karajan moment, for me, as I was struck by the same blow that the Austrian conductor Herbert von Karajan had described upon first hearing the great Arturo Toscanini conduct. I would also gain my first understanding of roundaboutness, the circuitous pursuit of goals that is fundamental to the Tao of capital. In the words of Karajan, who didn't achieve fame as a conductor until he was fifty and ultimately became the most renowned ever, in true Laozian style, Carrion secluded himself in the Austrian Alps for quiet, concentrated study and meditation, and withdrew from the direct clash against his competitors, a feint that we will hear of with the conifers of Chapter 2. As he wrote in 1947, For the moment, let the others decimate themselves in the Viennese battle of all against all. My time is sure to come, and I await it, calm and confident. And obsessively poring over his tattered scores, Mises's lecture concluded, I immediately started over, over and over again, until my favorite sections became a tangled ball of magnetic tape. What first stood out was the role of time in Mises's worldview. Time permeated everything. All action was a temporal succession of events, always of steps and fractions of time, the aim of which was the removal of future uneasiness, be it only the future of the impeding instant. Acting was to relieve our insatiable impatience and the pains caused by waiting. And overcoming this natural urge was the necessary key to productivity, roundabout production, 
the harvesting of the physically more abundant fruits of production processes, consuming more time, and thus the significant role played by taking account of waiting time. Mises rightfully credited this central notion of the roundabout to his predecessor. Mises rightfully credited this central notion of the roundabout to his predecessor, the great Austrian economist Eugen von Bombawerk. Degrees of impatience, what the Austrians call time preference, the singular source, in Mises's view, of interest rates, in waiting and foregoing immediate profits or consumption, and even bleeding capital, such as through costly capital expenditures, was a logical part of our humanness. Indeed, part of that humanness which we had to overcome to do certain propitious things, things which cumulatively amounted to the very progress of civilization. This was Clip's paradox, writ large, on the grandest scale, formalized and temporalized in the Austrian economic language. Moreover, of most immediate concern for me, as a treasury bond trader during a period of immense monetary interventionism, was a fundamental result of Mises's framework, taken to its logical conclusion, a society's time preference could not be repudiated, and the actual market rate of interest had to correspond to the underlying fundamental originary rate of interest. Any vain attempt to do otherwise, as when market interest rates are artificially set through monetary intervention, would mislead production and would result in an imbalance and distortion of the economy. Over time, forces would grow stronger and stronger to eliminate that imbalance and would inevitably succeed in violently driving the artificial rate back to its natural level, and thus the scheme would come to a necessary end. This inevitable seeking of balance from an artificial imbalance, this reversion of opposites was, to Mises, the very source of the cyclical fluctuations of business, the trade cycle, or more precisely, the boom and bust cycle, the subject of chapters 7 and 8. A State of Rest Underlying Mises' observations throughout was the basic unruliness of market prices, of their inherent subjectivity, a subjectivity that stems from the perceptions, needs, tastes, and impatience of humans. As he wrote in Human Action, no laboratory experiments can be performed with regard to human action. We are never in a position to observe the change in one element only, all other conditions of the event remaining unchanged. Historical experience as an experience of complex phenomena does not provide us with facts in the sense in which the natural sciences employ this term to signify isolated events tested in experiments. The information conveyed by historical experience cannot be used as building material for the construction of theories and the prediction of future events. There it was, the illusory task of predicting markets using empirical data, explained as well as it ever could be. This fundamental indeterminism led to the method of economics, what Mises specifically called the method of imaginary constructions. This was, for Mises, the singular method of praxeology, or the science of human action, which cannot, like the natural sciences, base its teachings upon laboratory experiments and sensory perception of external objects. It required the a priori deductive approach to knowledge, again endorsing Kant, by way of well-crafted gedanken, or thought experiments, a better description than imaginary, as these constrictions were often very real, just not easily observable or tractable. We might think of it as an introspection as a source of knowledge in the study of human action. To Mises, these were the axiomatic building blocks of all economic insight. Principle among Mises's praxeological precepts, in addition to the aforementioned time preference, was the notion of the market's state of rest or what he called the plain state of rest. The state of rest is essentially an occurrence in a market when the brokers have carried out all orders which could be executed at the market price. Only those potential sellers and buyers who consider the market price too low or too high respectively have not sold or bought. It is a lull that will end with any new initiating order in the market, any new demand for immediacy, be it in response to news or perceptions of traders and so forth. The state of rest is an intermittent end to all immediacy, a waypoint at which order flow is exhausted by mutually advantageous exchange, and it reoccurs in the markets over and over again. Mises added another layer to this concept with the hypothetical continuous yet ever elusive aim of the market, the final state of rest. This was the price at which all transactions continually balanced and cleared, where no change ever occurred again in a particular market, Truly, an imaginary construction never attained. 
the intended destination never arrived at. Every state of rest was the result of a searching, bargaining process, a price kampf, or price duel, as the Austrians called it, by which the markets were guided toward the final state of rest, though naturally something would change and it would never be reached. Mises' description of the market's ongoing temporal succession of events, then, was of ever moving from one state of rest to another, ever estimating the inestimable final state of rest. Guiding into Emptiness at times, waves of orders would buffet the bond pit like a tornado, and you could literally feel their surge in the vibrations of scrambling brokers through the floor before the market even moved, a moment when price swings were decidedly non-random in the pit. During those tumults, the prices no longer reflected a balance between buyers and sellers, or in bond futures, between savers and borrowers. Within the bond pit, as within all markets, is an elaborate, heterogeneous temporal structure, with the urgent orders at the bottom and various degrees of less urgent orders, the least direct, the most patient, the most roundabout, at the top. The orders would swirl around the pit, intolerantly pushing prices as they moved, until finally finding a temporal home, a fill. The errors corrected, there was a brief, eerie calm, a provisional state of rest, awaiting another swell in response. This was the messy process of price discovery in the pit, an experience that is today forever lost to the world, as such pit action described here no longer exists anywhere, a succession of failed balancing acts, with the locals as fulcrum, and in the futile search for the final state of rest is the market's grand homeostasis. Here was Mises's whole description of the market process, always disquieted by a striving after a definite state of rest, with each resulting price an error around the final state price, and these errors, what Mises called false prices, were the local's edge. The local needed to perceive as quickly as possible these false prices, the wedges between each successive state of rest and the final state, visible only in the constant entrepreneurial urge to immediately modify and correct them. Through an auction process that ultimately exhausted that urgency through overcorrection. Thus, the local responded to a force by guiding the price to a new imbalance, a new and brief false state of rest. Mises' market process made explicit what was implicit in the actions of the local, who certainly did not have to understand any Austrian economics. As the saying goes, the only PhD that counted in the pits was Papa has dough. As Mises described, they had Verstehen, or an intuitive grasp or understanding of entrepreneurial opportunism. What mattered to the local, their raison d'etre, was avoiding a swelling inventory, the result of one-sided urgent order flow, as in only sell orders, for instance. In avoiding this, like birds in the flock that alter their course to avoid bumping into a neighboring bird, they thus create complex and efficient dynamics in the whole, from exceedingly simple program-like individual objectives. Markets are necessarily asynchronous, and with each new asynchronous tidbit of transactional information, everyone alters their plans. And it is in ignoring this most elementary of observations that so much of modern economics fails, focusing as it does on a hopeless single ex-ante-equilibrium state where all transacting will happen free of time. Instead, the perfectly clearing ex-post Dutch auction price where all transactions within a period of time, if done simultaneously, would match up, is the moving target that is being repeatedly estimated in the cumulative aggregation of false prices, resulting from the processional states of rest. Indeed, so much of Austrian investing is about understanding and recognizing how these estimates can be wildly distorted. All of this occurred in the bedlam of the pit, in a succession of mini-routes to a succession of states of rest, something which could take many months or even years to learn to decipher in the pit. Though perfectly clarified by Mises, the market was not a casino game of flashing random variables, despite untold lives still spent studying their stochastic properties, but an intricate coordinating and balancing price concession process. Indeed, in Mises's construct was that of the pit trader. Oftentimes this process could turn into a coordinated, certainly skirting cartel-like manipulation, as large locals would nudge a market through and thus trigger anticipated stop orders, known as running stops to their positional advantage. This was basically about flushing out the immediacy hiding in the market, like a covey of quail. It could be as simple as recognizing the urgency in an order from a broker's visible stress, 
and other tells, or just sensing the crescendos and decrescendos in the order flow as the market explored different price levels. Here, Baldwin's coup de e in recognizing the decisive moment and his ability to wait for it rivaled Napoleon's. These are the basic machinations of market microstructure and of any marketplace, whether human locals or high-frequency robots, an endless alternating procession of routes. And it is the art of pit trading in leading the market into imbalance, a momentary false state of rest away from its final state. It could be subtle or violent, involving the slightest one-lot sell order at the bid price or thousands of contracts from one or many orders that sent the market into a tailspin. It was the ducking and weaving out of the flock, with no driver, no one in charge, only the search to exhaust and placate what was roiling it. Here was the link between the market maker's edge and the occasional huge moves of the market. The major routes were identical to the mini routes, only bigger, a property known in mathematics as self-similarity or fractal. Specifically, they were both about imbalance seeking balance, of false prices seeking correct prices. The wedge was just bigger. In the bond pit, order flow thus communicated, and the locals thus balanced the immediate intentions expressed by marginal savers and borrowers. This meant that, in fact, when there were no urgent active orders, the economy would, when there was no artificial price setting, be in a state which Mises called stationary, another of his praxeological terms we will revisit in Chapter 7. And a hypothetical final state of rest throughout an economy would provide what Mises called an evenly rotating economy, which we might think of as an economy in which nothing ever changes, a kind of economic dark ages. Understanding this process of liquidity is basically about understanding that any market exchange must be perceived as mutually beneficial to both parties. A failure to understand this, particularly in a market dislocation like a crash, is the source of much angst directed toward high-frequency traders, for instance, who cease their liquidity-providing activities and thus create liquidity holes. When markets get too volatile, why should we expect anything else? Why shouldn't the price of immediacy jump to infinity, along with perceived demands for immediacy? Why should anyone be expected to accommodate a counterparty at prices that are strongly believed to be in error? After all, to assume anything else would be to assume that liquidity providers are charities. Clip's lectures to me as a teenager were spot on, albeit expressed in different terms. In ever searching for and finding a new state of rest, the market was always intermittently and provisionally right in correcting an error, though in never arriving at a final state of rest, in never achieving a synchronized balance in all orders for immediacy, it was always wrong, and the greater the imbalance, the more wrong it was. Moving on. Despite childhood dreams of becoming a pit trader finally realized, Having moved up the steps from trading one lots to tens and then hundreds of contracts, the time came to move on. I had been increasingly targeting larger bond price moves through options, flashed across the trading floor into the bond options pit from the bond futures pit, and my edge was increasingly moving away from that of the local. Moreover, it was early 1997, and the death knell for open outcry was being told by growing volume in the competing electronic trading known at the Chicago Board of Trade as Project A. And along with this new technology came a raging U.S. stock market, an unprecedented asset bubble clearly from Mises, from an unprecedented monetary distortion. Greenspan had been on a loose monetary policy spree, following a Mexican debt crisis, and he inexplicably continued into President Bill Clinton's re-election. It would end either through Greenspan applying the brakes which seemed unlikely as he and Clinton had convinced themselves of a new economy that was far from a bubble, not too hot, but just right, the Goldilocks economy, or a capital and resource crunch applying them for him. Either way, the interest rate market was an extreme imbalance, an illusory temporary respite. Why plumb the murky depths of McGilligot's pool in the pit when whales were visible just under the surface? I moved to Wall Street to become a proprietary trader at a primary government bond dealer, an investment house that participates directly in Federal Reserve transactions and Treasury auctions, and moved from bond futures and options to my new specialty, mid-curve options on Euro-dollar futures, or short-term options expiring in less than a year, on forward three-month LIBOR contracts expiring in more than a year. Naturally, 
The premiums for these options were then very low, and owning them allowed me to acquire a favorable position in the euro-dollar futures once the market woke up. It was just like being back in the pit. Option contracts are a means of gaining immediacy, though conditional on a price threshold, the strike price. Owning them provides immediacy in the routes and hedging them, what option traders call long gamma hedging, can often pay for that privilege, and then some, by providing liquidity in the pit, thus earning back the price of immediacy. It was the perfect setup for an Austrian play. What quickly became clear, however, was that the significance of the trade wasn't predominantly in the hoped-for lump payout. It was in the advantage afforded by the timing of that payout. The interest rate shock I was targeting, either a surprise tightening like 1994 or a surprise easing from an inevitable credit bust, would be accompanied by a general market dislocation wherein immediacy would be in exceedingly high demand, and I would be essentially all alone in having the fresh capital to exploit it. As effective as the option trade was, it was but the prelude, an intermediate waypoint toward an even greater edge, an attack and counterattack of Tuichot. In the option trade was the temporal coordination of capital with its most advantageous and opportune use. This was a chance encounter with roundabout investing, the key to Clip's approach and paradox. Fishing most effectively by not even fishing at all, but rather by constructing a harpoon for later use, just in time for the appearance of a whale. As it turned out, the markets did not rest in 1997, nor especially in the summer of 1998. The obvious counterattack, upon booking gains in the euro-dollar options trades, was to short the freshly blown out on-the-run, off-the-run bond spread, and as it inevitably converged, I would follow it right back to zero. This was a pure flight-to-liquidity distortion, as everyone demanded the more liquid bellwether bond over the off-the-run bond, amplified by the ill-fated hedge fund long-term capital management, paying anything to unwind that very same convergence trade. It turns out their name was most apropos, as this spread was, with certainty, a perfectly profitable long-term trade. A shame that profit was entirely usurped by the path, by their profoundly shallow depth of field. Of course, Greenspan continued his monetary distortion apace throughout the crises, which meant the insurgencies would continue. Indeed, the whales of 97 and 98 would be but a preparation for much bigger thingamajiggers to come. I joined Nassim Taleb in 1999 as he was launching Empirica Capital, a mutually obvious relationship from our shared pit trading background and a shared view on the certainty of an eventual collapse in the then bubbly U.S. stock market. And to this day, there is no one with whom I more enjoy and benefit from sparring about tales. We called ourselves crisis hunters. We were, indeed, the first formalized tail protection firm ever, which we duly snagged in the 2000 equity collapse. This would be the highlight of an aggregate Empirica record that, while functioning well as a tail hedge, was the lowest return period in my career before or since, though much has been learned along the way, representing a wonderful barrier to entry as competitors come and go. We parted ways in 2005, and I went on to form my own investment firm, Universa Investments, moving beyond the basic mandate at Empirica. After I started, Nassim joined me again, but in a strictly hands-off, passive capacity. Nassim has since gone on to do voluminous and very significant work on uncertainty, specifically the black swan problem, as well as his neologism anti-fragility, the convexity of Marco, which has wonderful far-reaching consequences, albeit less straightforward, I believe, for capital investment. I discuss in Chapter 9 how extreme uncertainty and black swans are not the stories of the big stock market busts of the past century in the United States, including those during my career, and how the effectiveness of exploiting such busts, or tail hedging, is highly conditional on the particular environment of economic distortion. The real black swan problem of stock market busts is not about a remote event that is considered unforeseeable. It is rather about a foreseeable event that is considered remote, which I have spent the bulk of my career exploiting, and which explains the use of this moniker in some of my current partnerships. Although I naturally employ positive asymmetric convex payoffs, a trite thing to say, as in the familiar favorable risk-slash-reward, all the data clearly shows that most such volatility-loving payoffs are, and have been overpriced, ex-ante, using power law tail and other rigorous valuation measures, and ex post, 
And this is why I do not apply what has come to be known as the barbell strategy. These bets are mostly the stuff of gamblers and financial salesmen, from nonlinear derivative securities to highly volatile equities to momentum strategies of all stripes. Alone, they are a direct frontal attack. Rather, to me, convexity is an efficient, low-risk tool for exploiting routes of pent-up immediacy and distortion, but only under the right circumstances, as in the game of Twishou. And it is only a part of a roundabout strategy, an intermediate step, of Zohua and Nian, toward the decisive end goal of productive capital investment, the counterattack, not the game itself. It is a tool of Austrian investing, but not its key. That belongs to the roundabout, a depth of field, and of course the Austrians. Today one of my old Aqua Alpha trading jackets, stained with ink and blood, is mounted on my office wall, like a skin from some Hemingway-esque safari. Draped over it is a tattered Adam Smith necktie. From day one at the Board of Trade my uniform included this tie. Gamblers' ticks have their place, and neckties were required on the floor, but mostly I was following the example set by Uncle George, who proudly wore his with such zeal. Smith was, of course, the free market apostle who radically asserted its organic coordinating function. Mises himself had declared the publication date of Smith's magnum opus, an inquiry into the nature and causes of the wealth of nations, falling as it did on the same year as the United States' independence, the dawn of freedom, both political and economic. That tie was and still remains an important reminder for me that the pits, and markets in general, are not a casino, but a purposeful force, the Misesian market process at the very heart of the progression of civilization. It was a roundabout start, along a roundabout path toward the methodology of Austrian investing, from the pit to my current investment partnerships at Universa, which started constructing thingamajig harpoons in 2008, conveniently, though not coincidentally, put to productive use at the end of that year and into the next, and at Dow Capital, respectively comprising Austrian Investing 1 and 2 of Chapters 9 and 10. This is our path as we follow the Dow of Capital. The Wisdom of the Sages Legend has it that, during the Warring States period in ancient China, as one of the seven states began to fall into decline, Lao Tzu decided it was time to leave it behind and spend the rest of his days in solitude. As he made his way on an ox, he reached the border gate at Hungu Pass, the site of many a bloody battle. Beyond was Lao Tzu's unknown new home. As the story goes, the gatekeeper realized that Lao Tzu was leaving for good, forever taking with him all the wisdom he possessed, and entreated the old master to write down his thoughts for posterity. Lao Tzu complied and wrote down a concise treatise of some 5,000 Chinese characters. The story we can surmise is fictional, perhaps much like the author himself. What is undeniable, however, is the efficacy of the words that remained, which have lasted more than 2,000 years and still echo in the wisdom of the ages, a perception of time and the preeminence of patience, a depth of field and the roundabout way of doing by not doing and the very illusory nature of historical experience, the wisdom of an old grain trader who loved to lose money and of a great school of economic thought that would change the world forever. All would be scorned, yet all would persist and one day come together in an archetypal investment methodology. Chapter 2 The Forest and the Pine Cone The Roundabout and the Logic of Growth in Everett Clipp's last years, I made a point to visit him whenever I passed through Chicago. I would always try to bring him books, ranging from Austrian economics, for which he not surprisingly seemed to have a natural affinity, to probability, which often made no practical sense to this intuitive old grain trader. As we sat and talked, typically with his golf on in the background for mood, our conversations were punctuated by his favorite sayings, the Clippisms that I had heard so many times before. Since leaving the pit, however, one adage in particular took on greater meaning and resonated more deeply with me, despite its banality. Anyone can see the pine cones in the tree. None can see the trees. None can foresee the forest in the pine cone. In this simplest of sayings, once again, was Clip's great disdain for focusing only on the immediate, the tangible, the seen. And in it was also a dramatic story of struggle and conquest, 
Indeed, from the single cone to the finite numbers produced now, the immediate pales in comparison with all the trees to follow. And then, all the pine cones produced by those new trees, and so forth. We shift our thoughts beyond only what is visible now, a pine cone, to the seedling and seed pod producing conifer, and eventually the forest of look-ahead trees, over many iterative generations unfolding from countless changing environments and intertemporal ebbing and flowing of opportunities. Each seed is a solitary path or musical line with the potential for recursively branching into a raucous fugue. Some paths end abruptly, while others forge ahead far in time to a great many trees. So how do some of those paths navigate past many an intertemporal twist and turn of forest fires, disease, and competition? If we could follow one of those paths, where would it take us? What would the route look like? Would it randomly ramble aimlessly? Or would it rather follow a purposeful straightaway course? Somewhere in between, as it turns out, is the very roundabout way of the conifer. The necessary focus to merely recognize this path and its temporal waypoints is the very depth of field of the Tao. What matters most is not just the existence of a single pine cone, the seed pod that gives the conifer its name, cone-bearing, but all the unfolding opportunities that the conifer somehow perceives, whether the forest floor choked with overgrowth, the rocky outcroppings where competitors cannot thrive, or the fertile barrenness of a fire-cleared area that affect how and where its seeds will grow. As the Lao Tzu tells us, nature is our greatest teacher, indeed a major Taoist theme, inseparable from the totality of its message, is to observe and learn from nature. This is a common approach, contained even in the most basic of elementary school lessons. In this axiomatic construct, too, is enduring wisdom, readily found in the ancient texts that embrace metaphors, such as the tree yielding to the wind. As from the Lao Tzu, a tree as great as a man's embrace springs from a small shoot. Another quintessential Taoist image is the uncarved block known as Pu, a state of pure potential. In its uncarved state, the wood appears useless, and it takes tremendous imagination as well as patience to see what it can become. When the block is carved, it becomes useful. When the sage uses it, he becomes the ruler. Time bridges the two, the temporal aspect of means, after which the advantage emerges but the potential is gone. The Lao Tzu advises, quite simply, to see the unappreciated uncarved block, unassuming as the humble pine cone, as being fully ripe with potential of what is yet to be. For Clip, who grew up on a dairy farm in Mantino, Illinois, and later became something of a gentleman farmer, such depth of field perspective came naturally. From planting to waiting for harvest, there is no coercing a crop from the ground, no ripening it more hastily. The appreciation of the potential in the uncarved block, pu, is perennial in the newly seeded field, returning with every spring. Thus, the intertemporal positioning of fields, such as through crop and pasture rotation, has always been central to the strategy of farming. Moreover, there is no better reflection of the collective agrarian understanding of waiting for the opportune moment for decisive action than the adage, make hay while the sun shines. The temporal is embedded in the farmer's field, as expressed by no less than the great German writer Johann Wolfgang von Goethe in one of his most familiar couplets, which became his motto and appeared in the first edition of his novel Wilhelm Meister's Wanderjacher. Mein Erbteil wie herrlich, weit und breit, die Zeit ist mein Besitz, mein Acker ist die Zeit. My inheritance, how lordly, wide and fair, time is my fair seed field, to time I'm heir. With Clip's imagery of the pine cone, the conifer becomes emblematic, an evocative trope for the Tao of capital, and a pedagogical tool to better understand our archetypal roundabout strategy. We follow the example of the sages of the great Taoists' texts, who observed nature and drew from experiences, and tended to use mediums of image, historical illusion, and analogy to express complex ideas, theories, and concepts. As sinologist Roger Ames observed, what constitutes evidence and makes things clear in the text is often an effectively focused image, not a theory, an inexpressible and intimidable experience, not an argument, an evocative metaphor, not a logically demonstrated truth. The role of image, therefore, is as a vehicle for conveying knowledge and wisdom while remaining subordinate to them, so that once a certain meaning or sense has been conveyed, 
the linguistic tools themselves no longer matter. Thus, we are not merely learning about the growth of conifers and how they opportunistically exploit available resources. We see beyond the forest and the trees to the fundamental and universal lessons they contain. We look to the conifer and its logic of growth, and we learn from one of the truly great success stories of natural history. Through its adaptive strategy that has allowed it to survive over hundreds of millions of years, the patient and persistent conifer teaches us that it is far better to avoid direct head-on competition for scarce resources and, instead, to pursue the roundabout path toward an intermediate step that leads to its eventual position of advantage. The Forest and the Tree Among the conifers are the oldest species on the planet, known collectively as gymnosperms, meaning naked seeds, which first appeared some 300 million years ago and literally covered the earth by the time the dinosaurs took their first steps. Conifers are arguably the most successful members of the kingdom plantae, and rank among the most enduring of all living things on earth, along with such other hoary examples as cockroaches and ferns. Eight families of early conifers still exist, including the Panaceae family of pine, cedar, hemlock, spruce, and fir, with a fossil record dating back to the Cretaceous period, 150 million to 65 million years ago. During the Jurassic and early Cretaceous periods, 200 million to 150 million years ago, herbivorous dinosaurs, the likes of stegosaurs and sauropods, fed on conifers. Given their voracious appetites, these predators opened up large areas of fertile land, which had long been dominated by the conifers, to an emerging competitor, the flowering angiosperm, meaning covered seeds. After that, the world of the conifers was never the same. By the end of the Cretaceous period, the angiosperms had staged an impressive rout of the conifers, such that, 65 million years ago, nine out of every ten vascular plant species were angiosperms. Today, angiosperms continue to dominate with plant life that spans some 250,000 varieties, from grasses to trees, among them the deciduous maple, oak, ash, birch, and willow. With advantages from fast growth to more efficient reproduction with the help of insects, which are attracted to the angiosperms' flowers, their signature trait. The angiosperms have used their prolific and rapid colonization wherever and whenever possible to gain an upper hand over the conifers from which, no doubt, many descended. As a result, conifers are largely absent, for example, from lowland tropical and subtropical forests because angiosperms can outcompete them in such temperate environments through faster seedling growth. Yet, in certain times and places, Conifers not only reach the development threshold needed to thrive, but can outgrow and outlive their angiosperm competitors. As figure 2.1 in the downloadable PDF shows, the conifers change their pace of growth in a deceptive coniferous change-up. The growth rate of conifers in general lags that of the faster-growing angiosperms through the early phase of life. In fact, this is a highly calculated move, as it were, as conifers fall behind early on because they are assembling their assets, developing strong roots and thick bark, which allow them to become very efficient in resource use and to enjoy often impressive lifespans. This also means that, over time, as the graph shows, the longer living conifers can overtake angiosperms in biomass and height. The needled conifers may lack some of the internal efficiencies of the broad-leaved angiosperms, such as in vascular fluid conduction. Nonetheless, conifers manage to be more productive than angiosperms thanks to an edge that comes from their very roundaboutness. The slow accumulation of total surface of foliage. The evergreen conifer keeps several seasons of leaf growth. Its needles last for multiple years compared to the annual shedding of deciduous leaves, which eventually surpass even the most profuse angiosperm in total leaf surface area. For conifers, Growth is a patient process that takes tenacity and grit, and most successful with, and even requiring a roundabout strategy with slow early stages that create the structure for subsequent fast and efficient development. The conifer's progress exhibits the teleology of purposeful behavior that shows a goal-oriented mechanism in action from their adaptation as they retreat to the rocks as the means toward an end. In other words, conifers pay now for productivity gains later. In building efficiencies, they aim first toward means, step one, whereas the angiosperms in their immediate fast growth aim straight toward ends, the final step. 
Such purposeful indirectness, focused on means to the attainment of a desired end, does not occur just within the growth of a single conifer. It also governs the growth patterns of conifer stands within the forest. Of course, my intention is not to infer that conifers are capable of cognition. Their strategy is but an optimized product of evolutionary adaptations. In order to better their overall chances of survival, conifers cede to their competitors the immediate advantage in the most obvious areas, so that they can seed more opportunistically and effectively later on. For their nourishment and survival, conifers do not head directly to the source. Rather, like Robinson Crusoe, they first head in the opposite direction, away from the sea of fish and fertile soils, towards an interim step, in order to make a more effective and successful move to the source later on. To more fully appreciate the importance of this strategy, favoring the intermediate over the immediate, the circuitous over the direct, with metaphoric lessons for investors, we must first understand just how deadly the head-on clash can be. The Slow Seedling Interaction is a law of nature. When conifers and angiosperms grow in the same area, that interaction intensifies. In the local forest, amid a tangle of sunlight-hogging broad-leaved angiosperms, there is a riot of competition for scarce resources such as water, soil, and sunlight. In a direct clash for dominance, particularly in the most fertile, hospitable areas, the odds are usually stacked against the conifer, a continuous replay of the battle that dates back to the Cretaceous period. So what are their tactics? How do the two species compete? For many years, it had been assumed that competition between angiosperms and conifers occurred mostly at a later stage of development, when a canopy was created as branches from adult trees overlapped. This late growth was accepted as the root of the casual relationship between angiosperm invasions and conifer extinctions within specific areas in which there is co-occurrence of the species. What had not been explored by botanists until more recently was the impact of competition right from the start. Now, it is very well understood that the battle begins as soon as conifer seedlings manage to put down roots in dappled patches of sunlight among faster-growing angiosperms, but then quickly lose the ability to compete for a sufficient share of resources. The more densely populated a forested area, the more individual growth and performance become negatively impacted with competitive effects that include the number and size of neighboring plants and their proximity to each other. Plants that gain the first root hold or that encounter fewer competitors gain the edge of monopolizing local resources and thus grow more rapidly than those that are seeded later or that attempt to grow in more crowded areas. When deprived due to a resource crunch, young conifers become sickly and stunted and all the more susceptible to insects, disease, harmful fungi, litterfall, leaves, bark, and twigs that cover the forest floor, grazing herbivores, and the most voracious of all predators, fire. In these conditions, suppressed conifer seedlings lose ground and fail to thrive, a scenario that has come to be known as the slow seedling hypothesis. The Chiltern Mount Pilot National Park in northwestern Victoria, Australia, is home to a diverse mix of wildlife. What drew botany researchers to the park from 2004 to 2010 was the opportunity to test the slow seedling hypothesis in a unique laboratory-like environment with two distinct samples, a control group of conifers in a largely homogeneous stand and another commingled group of conifers and angiosperms seeded together. Specifically, botanists studied the interaction between a type of conifer known as calyptris related to cypress trees and eucalyptus the angiosperm that populates the park's extensive forests, both of which had reseeded in the park after a high-intensity fire in 2003. In areas in which seedlings from both species mixed, the calytris clearly lost to its faster-growing eucalyptus neighbors. Calytris seedlings were, on average, shorter and less healthy than the eucalyptus. In addition, seed cones were absent on the shorter calytris seedlings, preventing any propagation. In fact, Seed cones were produced by only the tallest calytris, which grew most abundantly where the population was largely uniform, in patches of virtually all conifers except for a few angiosperms. As the field study demonstrated, young calytris trees were most often the losers in head-to-head -head competition. Their very seeding was malseeding, producing plant growth that was inappropriate for the ecosystem, whose seedlings, due to recruitment bottlenecks, were constrained from ever reaching sufficient size and strength to thrive. 
Inevitably, they failed to even finish what they started. Stunted growth meant it took longer if it occurred at all, for these young trees to hit the threshold beyond which they developed some fire defense mechanisms. In some conifers, such traits include thicker bark and the ability to self-prune by shedding lower branches as they grow higher foliage to create a canopy. When small conifers do not thrive, they can fall victim to even low-intensity grass fires that would not do much damage to a more mature tree, but which will scorch and burn seedlings that have not topped above the high grass. Wildfire and Resource Reallocation In the forest, the commingling of aggressive angiosperms and suppressed conifers results in an overgrown tinderbox, especially vulnerable to a spark such as a lightning strike, or, as we might say, this is evidence of malinvestment that occurs unnaturally in the forest economy, where fire suppression is practiced, and the need for available resources to be reallocated to healthier growth. It is not the deadwood, not just the accumulation of a network of otherwise many small fires into one big one, the rationale that is cliché among the complexity types. Rather, it is artificial change in the ecosystem and the temporal structure of its growth patterns, a wearing out without replacement that makes the forest prone to fire. The failure of live trees to thrive and the forest's failure to adapt as a result of internal competition produce unhealthy, unwarranted, and unsustainable growth that upsets the balance of the system. Fire suppression leads to distortion as malinvestment continues, causing extensive overgrowth, as if there were more available resources than there really are. The forester fools the forest into reacting to a more benign, resource-laden environment for growth. The artificial environment of fire suppression collapses all the intertemporal strategies in the forest, as even the conifers is morphed into a fight for immediate survival, an effect we will hear about again in Chapter 7. The irony, then, is that this eternal Garden of Eden mirage prompts only a desperate head-to-head -head mad dash to the finish, even by the conifers, as if there were no tomorrow. Yet even then, distortion will eventually be corrected as the system seeks homeostasis, the topic of Chapter 8. At some point, alternation must occur to redistribute resources, which is accomplished largely through predators, especially small, localized wildfires. When a wildfire breaks out, everything is at risk, including the conifers that burn more quickly and easily because they are particularly combustible. In a high-intensity fire, pine trees ignite like torches. Smaller, naturally occurring fires, however, are nature's way of turning back the clock as resources are released and flow from trees that are not thriving to those that perhaps can. This is a crucial part of the discovery process and the control and communication within the system to determine the right mix and magnitude. In particular, in lower altitudes and in more temperate areas, periodic wildfires act as many routes to manage the succession of the forest over time searching for balance through constantly perturbed imbalance. Otherwise, angiosperms such as oaks and maples would dominate for extended periods of time, because they are more tolerant of each other at the seedling and sapling stages, and can shade out their conifer competitors and rob them of sunlight. Smaller wildfires, though, can even the score by creating change within the forest system. These incremental blazes also help prevent the major routes that prove deadly to the forest and are of benefit to no one. Thus, what might appear to be a destructive force is in actuality constructive, balancing the temporal structure of total growth in the forest. It's not that the forest needs disorder to further its growth, nor does it want major fires such as the infamous Inferno that ravaged Yellowstone National Park in 1988. Such massive destruction is as devastating to the forest as war is to civilization, and war is never good for a civilization. Civilizations advance through the accumulation of highly configured capital, which does not thrive amid extreme volatility and destruction. On the contrary, capitalism wants stability, but also the free competitive transfer of resources, through failures, bankruptcies, and the opportunity for profits, to where they are most suited to the needs of consumers. However, when there is a suppressed free market, then even a crash can indeed bring about good because it eliminates unhealthy growth or malinvestment. The parallel to the forest is an obvious one. Smaller wildfires enable the turnover of resources, transferring them between competitors from what we might view as a lower order of production, the fast-growing angiosperms, to more roundabout, higher-order production, the conifers. 
while small natural wildfires destroy with precision by definition. Great unnatural forest fires destroy indiscriminately. This is the unfortunate price paid for the necessary succession. Seeing the configuration of the forest in this way requires an appreciation that it is not a uniform blob of vegetation, but a highly heterogeneous temporal structure. The efficacious growth of the conifers, then, is but a test case of the roundabout strategy in the process of capital deployment, the Dow of capital and its destination of Austrian investing. The Conifer Effect Nature takes a roundabout, intertemporal approach. Indeed, this strategy is the conifer's singular advantage over the more aggressive angiosperms. The conifers can leave the more tangible and immediate gains from the fertile, sun-drenched areas to the angiosperms and retreat, thanks to their wind-borne seeds, to the rocky, exposed areas where conditions are harsh but sunlight is still plentiful. It is not that conifers prefer rocky, acidic, sandy, waterlogged, and other low-quality soils. Indeed, when they are planted and cultivated in better climates with more fertile conditions, conifers thrive. However, in order to avoid the direct competition for scarce resources, conifers retreat to inferior soil, wind-battered ridges, and low-lying areas where water collects, leaving the prime site to the faster growers. A happy coincidence worth noting is that the Austrian pine, a subspecies of the European black pine, or Pinus nigra, seems particularly drawn to the craggiest of terrain, pushing into the most barren areas, just as the entrepreneur, the focus and hero of the Austrian tradition, pushes out to the areas overlooked and yet undiscovered by his brethren competitors. Conifers obviously cannot send their seeds to a specific place. However, their seeds are, in a sense, directed. For example, strong winds generated by wildfires suck the windborne seeds from trees on the periphery into the ravaged areas. Serotonous cones that open only after exposure to high heat and flame also provide seed to regenerate growth after a fire. Even the tree's intermittent seed dumps may be attuned to wildfire occurrences. All these factors point to the logic of nature. Although the conifer is a dominant metaphor in this chapter and throughout the audiobook, in the real world of the forest, a universal strategy is at work that makes these trees among the most successful forms of organic life. In these less than desirable areas with thin, rocky, and nutrient deficient soil that cannot sustain other species, conifers find a niche thanks to a few adaptations that allow them to be highly efficient, making the most out of very little in exposed way stations en route to their ultimate gains. For example, mycorrhiza, a symbiotic association between conifers and fungi that colonize among their roots, helps the trees to absorb nutrients from the rocky soil. Other adaptations include the size and shape of conifer needles that reduce evapotranspiration to guard against moisture loss. Conifers also possess such defense mechanisms as rough bark and spiky needles, which discourage browsing herbivores, and even poisonousness in some varieties specific to their arch nemeses, the domesticated goats that will nonetheless devour them before exiting the gene pool, the do-not-eat-the-conifers rule in force. Conifers can furthermore tolerate significant temperature fluctuations, both intraday and seasonally, perhaps recalling their ancestors that survived extreme climate change, tectonic shifts, and geologic upheavals. This plays out on a far grander scale in the Great Boreal Forest, a northern biome also known as the taiga. The Boreal Forest wraps around the northern latitudes of the earth like a monk's tonsure, covering most of Canada and Alaska, the extreme northern regions of the continental United States, Iceland, Sweden, much of Norway, Finland, reaching down into the alpine regions of Europe, and much of Russia, northern Japan, and northern China. It is largely the backdrop of the characters in this audiobook. In a harsh climate with thin soil and limited sunlight, where the competition cannot grow, conifers have carved out their domain, the world's largest terrestrial ecosystem. At my home in northern Michigan, named Nabatic, Ojibwe for Within the Trees, almost a hundred years ago by its original owner, founder of the company that manufactured the first manual transmission, and was a major supplier to Henry Ford, who is featured in Chapter 5. On the very cusp of the boreal forest, a large stand of eastern white pines, Pinus strobus, lines the crest of a bluff overlooking a Lake Michigan Bay. These hardy trees have thrived for countless decades, perhaps a century or more, despite rocky soil, 
we have unearthed huge boulders and harsh elements, particularly during sometimes long, brutal winters. Each time I see them, I cannot help but admire their tenacity and efficiency, making the most out of conditions that stymie their competitors, and thus allow these conifers to grow unimpeded. During the Pleistocene Age, some 2.6 million to 11,700 years ago, a period of repeated glaciations, massive descending glaciers pushed the conifers southward to areas more traditionally dominated by angiosperms. Yet each time the ice cap receded, the conifers followed it right back to recapture their enclave in the north, where they had an edge over the angiosperms. Again and again, the conifers yielded as the glaciers extended to the south with gouges that plowed out the fertile valleys and piled up higher elevations that became the fields for later battles with angiosperms. As a result, over millions of years, conquering armies of conifer species that survived a great winnowing, which left only those species that could adapt to the harsh conditions and short growing season in the taiga, built vast empires in the permafrost of the northern climate in Eurasia and North America, the most extensive forests on Earth. Despite such an unforgiving environment, conifers can conceivably exist forever, to the point that perhaps after 200 years they will dominate completely, edging out all but the occasional angiosperm. But that is not the conifer's only refuge. Outside of boreal and high-elevation montane regions, islands of conifers can even grow among a sea of angiosperms by taking advantage of pockets of poor soil or other spaces with unfavorable growing conditions. The story, however, does not end there. It does not matter where one tree grows or what happens with one pine cone, which, as Clip reminds us, is all that we can see. Rather, we focus on what none can see, a roundabout strategy unfolding intertemporally in the forest, through the reallocation of scarce available resources. Conifers are soft, highly flammable, highly fragile, but in their roundabout intertemporal strategy, in gaining by losing, they are strong. Here again we see our two-step process, a strategy of intermediate objectives attained by a group of individual trees in pursuit of an edge, an eventual gain for the species. The conifer's indirect growth mirrors a central evolutionary mechanism of mate selection, in which the desirable objective sought is not for the direct material advantage of the parent, but rather to improve the fitness of the offspring. Indeed, conifers may be among the most indirect in all of nature when they forego direct material advantage by growing on the rocks, so that, following an intergenerational strategy, they might survive the competition in predators, especially fire and thus enable their offspring to one day take advantage of better growing conditions post-wildfire. In fact, given the long history of conifers' evolution, the adaptations and genetic mutations that have enabled them to survive and thrive in the most desolate areas have been ultimately focused on progeny, the untold generations in the future, which one day will gain the advantage during the succession of the forest and seed in the choicest of fertile areas. Thus it is the way of the conifer to forego the need for immediacy, the present state, and instead prepare for the counter-route, as the Lao Tzu states, that which shrinks must first expand, that which fails must first be strong, that which is cast down must first be raised, before receiving there must be giving. As Ames and David Hall wrote, the moon that has waxed full will eventually wane, the stand of cypress that has grown old will gradually be renewed. As nature shows us, that which can be defined as a singular, isolated event is not the focus, but rather what occurs within the context of a process. Here, too, the conifer blazes a trail for the Tao of capital. Insight into the wholeness of the process that we discern in nature, where everything in due course gives rise to its opposite, can be instructive in guiding the human experience. For the conifers, their roundabout strategy allows them to withdraw to inhospitable places, all the while producing innumerable pine cones loaded with seeds that can be expediently dispersed by the wind to other remote areas, giving rise to a phalanx of patient, long-living warriors awaiting the next route in the ongoing battle between conifers and angiosperms. Longevity among the conifers can reach some impressive extremes. It should come as no surprise that conifers are among the world's oldest known living things along with some 250 million-year-old bacteria found in a kind of suspended animation in ancient sea salt beneath Carlsbad, New Mexico, and a patch of submerged seagrass that is an estimated 80,000 to 200,000 years old. 
Nor should we expect to find these conifers anywhere except in harsh conditions that provide refuge, reduce competition, and eliminate overgrowth that makes trees susceptible to fire. In tundra-like conditions in northern Sweden, where angiosperms cannot grow, lives an ancient Norway spruce that has thrived there for an unbelievable 9,550 years, dating back to the last ice age. In actuality, it is the root system that has grown for nearly ten millennia, while the trees that sprout from these roots are considerably more recent, evident of a very efficient temporal structure. This living relic is a testament to the adaptability and longevity of the conifer, not only outsurviving its nearest competitors, but nearly everything else on the planet as well. Other long-lived conifers include a stand of Alaskan yellow cedar on Vancouver Island, which has been growing for more than 4,000 years. In mountainous regions of California, Nevada, and Utah, the Great Basin Bristlecone Pine lives up to its scientific name of Pinus longeva, literally ancient pine, with one particular specimen called the Methuselah tree in the White Mountains of California that is an estimated 4,800 years old. The coast redwoods of the Pacific Northwest include some that are more than 2,000 years old. Outside the window of my study in Los Angeles and lining my street, giant coast redwoods, many with a girth greater than my arms can span, provide a visible symbol and reminder of the universality of the roundabout strategy. And when such notable reminders abound, how has California so emphatically disparaged its roundabout industrial past? While conifers growing on the rocks may appear to be nature's outcasts, theirs is truly the false humility of the Taoist manipulator sage. They withdraw to where others cannot go, and then act when conditions suddenly shift and an opportune moment arises, such as after a wildfire. Then we can see the Wei Wu Wei, or what we might call here seeding by not seeding, of the conifers. By growing on the rocks, they avoid mal-seeding in the fertile areas, and thus establish a defensive position that in time becomes an offensive vantage point from which they can disperse seeds to be windborne to the fire-cleared areas, the same fertile ground from which they originally retreated. In nature's demonstration of twi show or push hands, conifers pose no resistance to the angiosperms in the obvious fertile places, yielding to the route that seeds them up into the craggy, isolated places. But when the angiosperms extend too far and produce dense overgrowth that leads to wildfires, the conifer follows them back, dumping their seeds on the newly vacated ground. As the ground cools, Conifer seeds from cones that survive the heat and flames begin to germinate in soil that has been enriched by nutrients released by the fire, and are soon joined by seeds blown by the wind from trees on the periphery and growing in the rocky, isolated areas beyond the reach of the fire. A few species of conifer produce resin-coated serotonous cones that open only during a forest fire, the greatest fire opportunists of them all. For example, the lodgepole pine is a particularly prolific seed producer with serotonous cones that are retained in the canopy for many years. Mature trees may hold well over 1,000 closed cones, and the amount of stored seed may number in the millions per hectare. In this scenario of forested schadenfreude, fire is friend, not foe, to the patient conifer, nature's greatest opportunist. Although some angiosperms will also move into the cleared area and spring up quickly, Conifers can often gain a root hold over this initial competition and, in time, develop into a largely homogeneous forested stand. Thus, as biologist and conifer expert Alyos Faryon wrote, it is the nature of the conifers to outlive their neighbors and occupy their living space. The very strategy of their growth exploits opportunities brought about by shifting ecology, climate, and the system's mechanism of adaptation through internal adjustment and discovery in pursuit of homeostasis. Along the Porcupine River in Alaska, it is water, not fire, that creates opportunities for the conifers to spread. The slow, meandering river cuts back the forest on the outer bends, and then deposits the sand, gravel, and clay on the inner bends, new soil for new growth. Fast-growing willows and poplars may seed first along the river, but eventually spruce trees native to the area make their way into the new ground. It is not that the climate is disadvantageous to the angiosperms. Rather, a slower rate of seedling establishment and growth results in favorable timing for the spruce, enabling these conifers to eventually gain an edge in the forest succession. The longer they live and the more numerous they become, 
The spruce alter the conditions of light and soil in their favor and thus become dominant. Over time in this northern ecosystem, these conifers replicate the dense growth that can be found in the surrounding homogeneous forest. Some have compared the roundabout strategy of the conifers that eventually gain at the expense of the initially more aggressive and direct angiosperms to Aesop's fabled race between the tortoise and the hare. But it is really a refined version. Call it the tortoise that morphs into a hare, in our fable. The tortoise doesn't remain slow, but rather builds his strength and gradually accelerates. The strategy of the conifer. An impressive example can be found among the giant sequoias of California that experience an increased rate of growth even after maturing to towering heights, over 200 feet, compared to much younger trees in the species. Another apt image is found in the Lao Tzu, reminding us once again that soft and weak vanquish hard and strong with a highest efficacy that is like water. It is because water benefits everything, yet vies to dwell in places loathed by the crowd, that it comes nearest to proper way-making, in dwelling, the question is where is the right place. The Logic of Growth As we have seen, it is not that the forest would somehow be better off with only conifers and no angiosperms, rather a give and take, a search and discovery process, an adapted alertness to opportunities, and always emanating from the imbalances of states of rest, must be allowed to unfold naturally in order to create the most efficient balance of available resources between them. In the forest system, advantages are not static, but emerge and change with time. Within parts of an established forest, angiosperms may take over for a certain period, while conifers become roundabout, thus losing and bearing the cost in the immediate of giving up the fertile, more desirable places, loving to lose, hating to win. Then wildfires or other disturbances stop the angiosperms' lead in the race, creating openings for the opportunist conifers, gaining by losing, followed eventually by even more sprinting angiosperms. In the alternation of the flow of resources as the ecosystem discovers the right mix over time, there is a logic of growth. Maladjustments result in a world of change. Indeed, they lead naturally to that very change, setting in motion forces that will eventually eliminate and correct them. In the forest, maladjustments, overgrowth, susceptibility to predators, presage change in the system. Alternation in the search for balance is the rule of nature. Neither order nor disorder, which we can grasp only by seeing the entire process with its many interconnected intermediate steps. The conifer's faster and more efficient later stage growth is a tremendous productivity advantage, and it would be perhaps insurmountable were it not for the angiosperm's equally potent counteracting check, a progressive tax, as it were, on the time it takes the conifers to reach that later stage. In the productivity of the conifer's roundaboutness, of efficiencies gained at the expense of the immediate, is the logic of growth for the forest. Its realization is in the forest's succession, which rewards the waiting game. Nature's progress, her secret, is in her depth of field, implied in the roundabout path of the conifer the directional choices that lead right in order to proceed more effectively left. Through this pedagogy from an ancient tree, we best build our understanding of this central roundabout strategy, a universal lesson taking us from the boreal forests to, as we will hear, the canonical military strategists stretching across twenty centuries from China to Prussia and leading us to the great economic thinkers of late nineteenth-century Austria. But perhaps it will still be in the conifer that we see it at its most poignant in the simple pine cone and the forest yet to be. Chapter 3 Sure, the Intertemporal Strategy Across more than 2,000 years and 4,000 miles, two hideously violent yet highly creative epochs in human history, the Warring States period of ancient China and the military conquests of Napoleonic Europe, shaped the political landscapes of their times and gave rise to what have become two canonical texts of a universal strategic methodology, the Sun Tzu, attributed to a Chinese general known as Sun Tzu, or Master Sun, and Von Krieger, on war by the Prussian Major General Karl von Clausewitz. Traditionally, but erroneously, they have been positioned as contrasts, completing each other like a perfect couple formed of opposites, not only chronologically but philosophically. 
Vom Krieger has been typically viewed, particularly by its most vehement critic, English military historian Sir Basil Henry Liddell Hart, as advocating total war waged through the most deadly means of direct confrontation, while the Sun Tzu avoids destructive clashes whenever possible and instead subdues the enemy through indirect means, such as manipulation and deception. Within what is the greatest and most efficacious of human strategic thought is a common thread that, though winding and tangled, will lead us to an understanding of how it is applied in other realms of human endeavor with complex objectives, the most significant of which, I would argue, is capital investment, specifically the methodology of Austrian investing. The thread shows us a metasystem, perhaps obvious, though nonetheless difficult to implement, of intertemporal exchange, the pursuit of an intermediate state whose efficacy furthers the realization of a desired final state, instead of just charging ahead toward a final state alone. Recent examinations of the two works reveal strategic commonalities between the voluminous von Krieger, whose meanings must be carefully extracted out of its convoluted prose, and the almost cipher-like, highly nuanced Sun Tzu. There are obvious connections. Both are about war, the deadly preoccupation of the human race, and completely anathema to the advancement of civilization, and both carry their author's unblinking realism about the bloody and destructive nature of warfare. Moreover, these two preeminent military strategists were products of their times. Neither armchair theorists nor instigators of conflict, they were nonetheless immersed in the warring culture that surrounded them. Not surprisingly, their works are required reading today at such institutions as the U.S. Military Academy at West Point. Ask any student of military strategy what languages one must know to read the classics in the original, and the answer will invariably be Chinese and German. The latter, I would also add, is singularly necessary for that of economics. Beyond these similarities, there is a deeper and far more important thread between Sun Tzu and Clausewitz. Both recognize that not all battles are decisive. Rather, it is far better to deploy the roundabout strategy, that which we have discussed thus far, of patiently achieving an intermediate position of advantage, the teleology of efficacious means toward realizing an eventual final objective. Clausewitz used the framework of Ziel, Mittel und Zweck, a strategically circuitous path from the intermediate aim, Ziel, of subordinate commanders as the means, Mittel, for the strategists to obtain the ultimate end, Zweck. Sun Tzu employed the same intertemporal approach, indirect now in order to be direct later, summed up in a single word, sure, by which the wise general gained a strategic advantage over his enemy, intervening upstream before the conflict unfolds, and thus without having to join serious battle subsequently, as a means of ending and even avoiding battle. As the Sun Tzu states, to win a hundred victories in a hundred battles is not the highest excellence, the highest excellence is to subdue the enemy's army without fighting at all. Ambiguous and imprecise, sure, pronounced like the affirmative sure, has no formulaic translation into English, but rather is defined with a cluster of meanings. Among them are potential, disposition, configuration, influence, and most important to the military theorist, strategic advantage, which can be extended to positional advantage or advantageous deployment. We might call it cultivating the influence of the present on the future. These multiple definitions are not choices from which to pick and choose, but rather parts of a much larger, complex whole. The etymology of the Chinese logogram, for sure, is a pairing of what is thought to be a hand holding an object, meaning to sow, to plant, to cultivate, including the cultivation of artistic talents and skills, and in some interpretations what is held is seen as a clod of earth indicating something being put in position, with that of force or li, a hononym for sure, in an oral tradition they would essentially be the same word, and in fact are often used interchangeably, brings in a temporal association as an opportunity. The potential of concentrated energy is embodied in the image of the dragon, another sure motif that is also commonly used in Chinese symbolism. As sure imagery, the dragon dynamically and strategically morphs from water creature to sky dweller, able to take a concrete form and then diffuse into misty vapors. Although a rather common term in Chinese culture and not given any particular philosophical significance, sure is the defining concept of the Sun Tzu, 
not to mention, along with the analogous Ziel Mittel und Zweck of this audiobook. To the militarist, Schur conveys the importance of gaining influence through non-intervention and non-deployment to ultimately secure battle advantage. Thus, the circuitous Schur is to the Sun Tzu as the roundabout Wu Wei is to the Lao Tsa. Indeed, Schur becomes the strategy of Wu Wei, as the Lao Tsa states, marching without appearing to move. Schur, as positional advantage, overlaps the concept of Sing, strategic positioning, or as we might say, Schur is the greater superiority gained through Sing. D.C. Lao, a leading translator of Taoist texts, has observed that there are passages in the Sun Tzu in which the two terms are near synonyms. The strategic positioning, Zing, of troops is most prominently compared in the Sun Tzu to the positioning of pent-up water in a mountain stream, and its potential is sure, eventually gushing downward, carrying boulders as it plunges in a powerful yet effortless surge, ultimately overcoming everything in its path. The sage acts by positioning himself upstream from its full deployment. Paradoxically, water is one of the softest and yet strongest forces in nature. Sure can also serve as a tool in the same way that a handle makes an axe so much more effective. The intermediate advantage is in both the tools and their assembly, their purchase, another meaning for sure, the configuration of assets into the means of an ultimate objective. An asset need not be physical or material. It can be a state, as in an advantageous readiness. Strategic positional advantage is never fixed, but emerges intertemporally through roundabout means amidst fluid and shifting factors. The enemy's strategic position, the rise and fall of the terrain, light and dark, cold and heat, sun and fog. With awareness of all these elements, the commander must move only when they are in optimal alignment and actively seek a position of their optimal alignment. The sure of Sun Tzu was to make the most of this strategic advantage, and if there is no advantage, do not move into action. This may mean occupying the key passes and lying in ambush. When there is no such terrain, one must hide in the shadows and the mist, and go by way of places that would never occur to the enemy, and thus catch him off guard. Just as in Tui Shou, push hands, the objective is to wait for the attainment of a position from which one can exploit an imbalance within one's opponent, which will make the ultimate route all the more effective. The central sure concept can also be found in von Krieger, in the deployment of military forces toward a zeal or aim, itself a mittel, or means along a roundabout path toward eventually reaching the Zweck, the ultimate end. For example, Clausewitz advocated weakening the enemy first at certain focal points, instead of expending resources, especially one soldiers, by battering against entrenched defenses in the all-out attack, die Schlacht, or slaughter. This common thread, therefore, effectively ends the debate that has raged across centuries and alters perceptions that saw the Sun Tzu and Vom Krieger as polar opposites. The two generals, one Chinese and one Prussian, are not philosophical opponents, but strategic doppelganger. Clausewitz, certainly the greatest of all military strategists, provides us with further clues and perspective for studying the strategy of war to glean insight into other complex human pursuits. As he wrote in Vom Krieger, we therefore conclude that war does not belong in the realm of arts and sciences, rather it is part of man's social existence. War is a clash between major interests, which is resolved by bloodshed. That is the only way in which it differs from other conflicts. Rather than comparing it to art, we could more accurately compare it to commerce, which is also a conflict of human interests and activities, and it is still closer to politics which in turn may be considered as a kind of commerce on a larger scale. The teleological means-end framework is indeed implied in the sure approach, and there are some, with a too simplistic view, who would take issue with this, of accumulating upstream strategic and advantageous means, tangible and intangible, so that the final end can best be served. Thus, the overarching concepts and keywords are sure, the very manifestation of the Tao, and its German equivalents of Ziel, Mittel und Zweck, all of which become central to the Tao of capital. To further our understanding, we must again travel back in time, first to ancient China and an era of philosophic diversity, during which emerged a Taoist general who rightly became one of the most celebrated military minds. The Tao of Sun Tzu 
From Qi on the Yellow Sea to Qin on the plains to the west, seven Chinese feudal states battled for dominion during the aptly named Warring States period, from 403 to 221 BCE. Military service became obligatory for all men, and by 300 BCE, regional warlords mobilized armies numbering in the hundreds of thousands of drafted foot soldiers. As war raged among the semi-autonomous states, traveling military strategists offered their expertise to the feudal rulers. Among those itinerant experts was said to be a general from the state of Wu, named Sun Tzu, who later became known as Sun Tzu, or Master Sun. The quintessential warrior philosopher, Sun Tzu personified his times when political survival was paramount and warfare, by necessity, became applied philosophy. Like the Lao Tzu, the Sun Tzu, also known as the art of war, came from an oral tradition, which makes authorship cumulative over time, thus calling into question the historic validity of Sun Tzu as the sole source of the text, and spawning theories that there may have been more than one master son. Translated first from Chinese into French by a Jesuit missionary in 1772, the Sun Tzu has since been published in most of the world's major languages. Its wide-reaching sphere of influence, along with that of Vom Kriege, spans Mao Zedong, though many attach his guerrilla strategy to the Sun Tzu. He was actually closer to European strategists, Henry Kissinger, the Soviets, and the Viet Cong. And, of course, it had been superficially applied in business management in ways that quickly became cliché. With deep knowledge of highly effective military campaigns, Master Sun knew how to turn soldiers into a disciplined army, and an army into an efficient fighting machine. One story told about Sun Tzu, although considered more legend than fact, tells of his service to a warlord from Wu State. Asked to demonstrate his skill as a military leader, Sun Tzu agreed to train the ruler's harem of concubine as soldiers, and divided the 180 women into two battalions, appointing the two favorites as commanders. But when his orders produced giggles instead of strict compliance, Sun Tzu ordered the execution of the concubine commanders. Although the warlord protested and suddenly lost interest in this war game, the rest of the harem began to follow Sun Tzu's orders without question. Taoists are certainly not all pacifists. Sun Tzu was the genesis of the indirect approach, and demonstrated mastery of being direct within the indirect, constructing and seizing upon those opportune moments when it is indeed time to act. His was a strategic thought of inherent, though not explicit, means and ends through the efficacy of the setup. Thus, who will win and who will lose are less a matter of chance. As the Sun Tzu states, the task of a good general is to calculate in advance and with accuracy every factor, so that the situation develops in a way as beneficial as possible to him. Victory is then simply a necessary consequence. Even better, though, in the eyes of Sun Tzu, is the wise commander who, in recognizing the destructiveness of war, establishes positional advantage and thus uses threat, manipulation, and deterrence to subdue the enemy and convince the opponent to withdraw or surrender without coercion. The commander takes the enemy's walled cities without launching an attack and crushes the enemy's state without a protracted war, winning without fighting. These words echo Wu Wei and the Lao Tzu, itself a military and political treatise. I dare not make the first move, but would rather play the guest. I dare not advance an inch, but would rather withdraw a foot. Moreover, rather than ascribe war to the Sun Tzu and more philosophical matters to the Lao Tzu, we recognize that warfare was the source of this philosophy, a response to this horrific period during which strategic thoughts sprouted from the fertile soil of the contemptible battlefield. In his conduct of war, perhaps the Taoist, and thus the naturalist, Sun Tzu drew inspiration from the conifers, which retreated to unwanted territory that then became their strategic outposts, marching through territory where there is no enemy presence, attacking what the enemy does not defend, and defending where the enemy will not attack. And perhaps this reveals Sun Tzu's call to see the seed even before it is grown. Yet, when the opportune moment to strike appeared, there was one weapon, one of the premier technological innovations of the age, which changed the way war was waged, the crossbow, which in its potential and intermittent force embodied Sure. Sure and the crossbow. 
most likely introduced into China by non-Han people as early as 500 BCE. The crossbow became widespread by 200 BCE. In Sun Tzu's home state of Wu, elite troops wore heavy armor and helmets, strapped spears to their backs and a sword at their waists, and carried a crossbow and 50 arrows on their shoulders as they marched as many as 50 kilometers in a day. The archers set their arrows on the horizontal stocks of their crossbows and drew the bowstrings taut. It is thought using their legs and foot stirrups to brace the bow. Then they were at the ready, fingers on the trigger mechanisms, which would release the coiled energy, producing enough power and velocity to pierce the armor and shield of an enemy a hundred paces away, while the archers remained well beyond the reach of the opponent. With the crossbow, proximity became an important factor in battle, in both time and space, as one could suddenly kill effectively at a distance from out of nowhere, and thus the setup and its efficacy became the aim. As Sun Tzu said, that a bird of prey, when it strikes, can smash its victim to pieces, is due to its timing. So it is with the expert at battle that his strategic advantage is channeled and his timing is precise. No such advantage came from a head-to-head -head clash of swords, an aggressive face-off between opponents. Sure, though, was found in the loaded crossbow and was personified by the archer, who did not rush into action but instead employed time and positioning until the optimal moment to unleash. Here again, as we saw with Zan Sun Feng and Tai Ji Quan, is explicit reference to the control and coordination of a predator with its intended target, the tactical feint and sudden strike of a snake. So important is an understanding of Shur that the Pentagon, in reports to Congress just a few years ago on the People's Republic of China, used sure to explain that country's grand strategy of maintaining balance among competing priorities for sustaining momentum in economic development and maintaining favorable trends in the security environment within which such development can occur. More evidence that the sure concept can be most confounding. A report from the office of the U.S. Secretary of Defense, while noting a lack of a direct Western translation, defined sure as a strategic configuration of power and as roughly equivalent to an alignment of forces, as well as potential and propensity which only a skilled strategist can exploit. To summarize, a sure strategy boils down to acquiring positional advantage and superiority for an easier, if not assured, victorious fight to follow. Sure is always focused more on the future than the current moment, an emphasis on upstream, intermediate aims, or intermediate foci within the field, becoming means and by which the ultimate ends can be more readily achieved. The path to victory, therefore, is reduced to the essential element of adhering to sure, an intertemporal advantage, instead of the headlong rush into conflict, an approach known as Li. Li, the direct path. Everything has its opposite. Alternation occurs between distinct but complementary pairs. In the Tao, yin, unseen, hidden, passive, balances and is balanced by yang, seen, light, active. The antithesis to shur, the intermediate and circuitous is li, the immediate and direct. As the all or nothing of a pitched battle, li seeks decisive victory in each and every engagement. The false shortcuts denounced by the Lao Tzu, a model of warfare bequeathed to us by the Greeks, of Hannibal, the great Carthaginian commander, a perspective of finality that correlates closely with Lee's attempt to win now what some call a very Western worldview. In contrast, Schur can be likened to a journey made up of many steps across a depth of field from one step to the next. It unfolds like a Taoist scroll on which a path running up a mountainside, and thereby giving it consistency, appears at one point, then disappears around the hill to reappear even further on. The forward-looking sure strategist takes the roundabout path towards subtle and even intangible intermediate steps, while the Lee strategist concentrates on the current step, the visible power, the direct, obvious route toward a tangible desired end, relying on force to decide the outcome of every battle. Simply stated, Lee goes for the immediate hit, while sure seeks first the positional advantage of the setup. The former is the aggressor racing against time, and who, in his directness, risks becoming overextended, stretched too thin, and thus vulnerable to the counterattack. The latter, the non-aggressor, with no need to rush, 
puts time on his side, even to the point of seeding an unimportant clash now in order to come back all the stronger later on. Sure and Lee at the Wei Chi board. Perhaps the clearest and most pedagogical example of the contrast between Shur and Li strategies is in Wei Qi, pronounced Wei Qi, roughly meaning encircling game. More commonly known as Aigo, or simply Go, its Japanese name. Originating as many as 4,000 years ago in China, making it the world's oldest existing board game, Wei Qi teaches lessons in strategy and geopolitical diplomacy. According to legend, Wei Qi was invented by an emperor to enlighten his son on the same. Just as the Sun Tzu advocates a sure strategy to overcome an enemy gradually, enabling victory without making every battle decisive, through softness rather than through hardness, the same approach is deployed with great effectiveness in Wei Qi. Learning the game of Wei Qi instructs and practices the specific strategic and operational ideas of the Sun Tzu, and provides insight into its philosophy, stratagems, and tactics. Sure versus Li. Sure, roundabout, intertemporal. Li, direct, atemporal. Sure, emphasis on means. Li, emphasis on ends. Sure, patient, non aggressive. Li, impatient, aggressive. Sure, seeks to secure future advantage through immediate objectives. Li, focuses on immediate results rather than accumulating means. Sure, counterforce. Li, force. Sure, subtle, intangible. Li, dramatic, tangible. Sure, outcome of most battles immaterial. Li, outcome or every battle decisive. Sure, progress is continuous. Li, progress is sequential. Sure, focused more on cause. Li, focused more on effect. Sure, zeal, mittel, li, zvek. Sure, wu wei, li, wei. How the game of Wei Qi unfolds is illustrative of sure versus li thinking, which can even unintentionally set up an east versus west contrast in philosophy and in war and diplomacy. Author and Wei Qi expert Peter Shotwell notes that li, as a general term, can mean a direct profit oriented yang strategy one that gets things done, while sure is a yen strategy that prefers to go for influence at the expense of immediate profit or advantage. Sure is intertemporal. Li is myopic. Wei Qi is played on a board marked with a 19 by 19 grid. Smaller boards for beginners may be 9 by 9 or 13 by 13. Representative of the earth, then thought to be flat, the board has a square shape that symbolizes stability and four corners that stand for the seasons. Stones are used as game pieces, one set black and the other white. Their round shape connotes mobility, while their uniform size shows them to be equal in power, with no differentiation among them. The contrast with chess is obvious, from its complicated hierarchy of pieces to its relatively direct pursuit of total annihilation. In essence, Wei Qi is a simplistic game, yet out of that simplicity comes great complexity and sophistication. Wei Qi is, in fact, the most calculated of games, the exponential explosion of possible permutations of future moves and scenarios in the look-ahead tree is yet too many for the best optimizing computer player to defeat the best human, unlike in chess. Rather than sequentially thinking ahead many moves, in Wei Qi, the best strategy comes through backtracking, inverting the problem from a decisive positional advantage at the end to the present means to that end. The object of the game is to surround the most territory on the grid. At the start, the board is empty. The player with the black stones plays first, placing a piece on the board at any intersection where two lines cross. Players then take turns putting stones on any unoccupied intersection. If a player manages to occupy all the liberties or intersections around an opponent's stone or group of stones, that stone or group is captured. At the end of the game, the player whose stones encircle the most intersections, netted against stones captured by the opponent, wins. Given the objective, an obvious initial strategy is to dive for the corners of the board, the quickest territory to surround, since the sides of the corners already provide half of the enclosure. Going for a solid immediate gain, however, is typically suboptimal in Wei Qi. A sure strategy is the preferred approach, with the patient accumulation of influential positions that create future potential and relative advantage. 
rarely obvious at first, but emerging slowly over time. In figure 3.1 in the downloadable PDF, depicting the first 11 sequential moves in a game, both black, moves 1 and 3, and white, move 2, play a very standard star point opening. The divergence in their strategies emerges when white, move 4, does not respond in kind to black's move, with a stone in an open space on the board. Instead, white remains in the same corner, in hopes of establishing immediate points. With its subsequent plays, moves 6, 8, and 10, white seals off its corner, but in doing so allows black, with moves 5, 7, 9, and 11, to create enormous potential to eventually surround much of the vast territory in the middle of the board. Black, employing the indirect and circuitous sure strategy, seeks future opportunistic potential. They are truly playing two different games that are not even against each other. Black competes not against the position of white stones, but rather against a future position of white stones. Such advantage, however, will not be obvious at first. On a larger scale, it is in fact an exceedingly difficult intertemporal trade-off. At first, Black will appear to have captured no territory at all, and indeed, at the end of this sequence has scored no sure points. White, though, has 30 unassailable points, which seems to validate its Lee approach, but the allure is only in the immediate, the tangible. Black's current position will likely eventually amount to 50 points, which would be an extraordinary lead. Competitive Wei Qi matches typically come down to very low single-point spreads. White's territory is far more assured, but Black's is greater. This was the cost for Black's lead, an immediate payment in exchange for the edge further down the road. Black has essentially husbanded his resources, withdrawn them in order to assert them more decisively later, when Black's subsequent moves in the center will have much support. It is an intertemporal trade-off of aiming at a means to a greater end, rather than directly at the end. It is the roundabout way. We can see, too, in the Wei Qi match, that the means of positional advantage provide for the opportunism of decisive blows that occur toward the end, in what might even appear as a surprising tail event to someone watching the scoreboard only. Refer to Chapter 9. Indeed, it is the whole point of the sure approach, the whole point of the difficult sacrifice of the immediate. Within sure is Lee, just as within sure's logogram is Lee. After being loaded and drawn, the crossbow must be fired, because if it were never fired, it would not be sure. In the opening sequence in Figure 3.1 of the downloadable PDF, we see in the Wei Qi board perhaps the purest example of sure that I could ever imagine. Sure in its perfection. Real-world examples are everywhere, but much subtler. What is clearest in this ideal is that sure actually requires Li in the opposition in order to be effective. It is the hungriness and immediacy of the latter that provides the edge to the former, much like Lou Burdett from Chapter 1. A Wei Qi match between two opponents employing the same such strategy is a far different game altogether, and far more difficult for Black. A Common Thread from East to West From the culture and philosophy of ancient China, we move on to Napoleonic Europe, which, like the Warring States period, saw bitter battles for domination and advancements in the art and technology of warfare. And, like ancient China, this era in European history had an incomparable military scholar and scribe, Karl Philipp Gottlieb von Clausewitz. There is confusion around the spelling of Clausewitz's names, but we will follow what is written on his tombstone. Clausewitz was a child of war, born in 1780, at a time when revolutions reshaped the political landscape of Europe and North America, and gave rise to despotic powers in the person of Napoleon Bonaparte. At the age of 13, Clausewitz entered the Prussian army as a Fahnenjunker, cadet, and by 1793 through 1794 was part of the Prussian forces in the first coalition against Napoleonic France. The Prussian ruler Frederick the Great had kept the officer corps free of commoners, thus Clausewitz and his brothers could only be accepted as officer cadets after the king's death in 1786. Although born into a middle-class family, as opposed to the aristocratic Junkers, Clausewitz and his brothers eventually became generals, and thus rightfully earned the nobiliary particle von that their father added to the family name, perhaps with a fictitious claim to some ancient noble tie. In 1826, the family's right to the claim of nobility was affirmed. 
In 1801, Clausewitz was admitted to the War Academy in Berlin, from which he graduated at the top of his class in 1804, and was made an aide de camp to Prince Auguste of Prussia. It was also during this time that he met his future wife, a noblewoman considered well above his station in life, Countess Marie von Brühl. A lifelong military officer, Clausewitz followed in the bootsteps of his father, Friedrich Gabriel Clausewitz, who had entered the Prussian army as an officer cadet in 1759 and fought in the Seven Years' War, 1756 through 1763, which embroiled Prussia, Great Britain, and their allies on one side, and France, Spain, and their allies on the other. War spread over parts of Europe, Africa, India, North America, where it became known as the French and Indian War, South America, and the Philippines. Upheaval and revolutions followed the Seven Years' War, as established European powers suddenly appeared vulnerable to attack. The American colonies broke from Great Britain, thus inspiring the French Revolution. The overthrow of the French monarchy was a watershed event that forever changed Europe. Blood ran in French streets as the monarchs and their supporters were executed by La Guillotine before the crowds. Chaos and bloodlust created a vacuum into which strode a French military officer, a Corsican born of parents of noble Italian ancestry, who had successfully led military campaigns for the French, Napoleon Bonaparte. In 1799, Napoleon installed himself as first consul following a coup d'etat. In 1804, he crowned himself emperor. Despite his hatred of Napoleon, Clausewitz studied him and even admired his military tactics. Napoleonic battles would later serve as a centerpiece of Clausewitz's opus, Vom Kriege. But the defeat of Napoleon was nothing less than Clausewitz's life work. Ironically, since it might have saved him much trouble, it is safe to assume he never read the Sun Tzu, simply because Clausewitz despised all things French and refused to speak the language, the only one from Europe into which it had been translated by that time. Politically, in response to Napoleon's attempts to plant the French flag over much of Europe, alliances and empires were formed. In 1804, to counter Napoleon, the Austrian Empire, which had been preceded by the Habsburg dynasty's Holy Roman Empire, was born. It included all or parts of what are today Austria, Croatia, the Czech Republic, Hungary, Italy, Poland, Romania, Serbia, Slovakia, Slovenia, and the Ukraine. Austria and Prussia overcame a long-standing conflict over which should be recognized as the legitimate force among German-speaking people. Although they had opposed each other during the Seven Years' War, Austria and Prussia improved relations to the point that both countries were able to cooperate during the Napoleonic Wars. Their common antipathy toward Napoleon's aggression was embodied in a one-time admirer, the inimitable Ludwig van Beethoven, from Prussia but residing in Austria, who originally dedicated his Third Symphony as the Bonaparte Symphony, but became so enraged by Napoleon's self-coronation that he vigorously scraped the name from the title page of the score and renamed it Eroica. For the ever-decisive Napoleon, timing was everything in his conquests. As he reflected, I may lose a battle, but I shall never lose a minute. Napoleon's basic strategy was one of upsetting the enemy's balance, so that once the equilibrium was broken, the opponent became an easy defeat. He plied this strategy against Austria, France's most determined opponent, by positioning northern Italy, termed the junior partner, as the corridor to get to Austria, the senior partner. After that, Spain and Italy would then quickly follow. His plan worked. By drawing Austria's forces into successive offensives against him in Italy and defeating them there, he gained, twelve months later, an open road into Austria. Clausewitz received a first-hand view of Napoleon's strategy in a battle against French forces in 1806. Prussian soldiers were overpowered, and Clausewitz and Prince Auguste were captured. Held in captivity in France and Switzerland, Clausewitz's imprisonment gave him time to write, deepening his understanding of what he recognized as the essential differences between the French and the Prussian armies as they waged war. He went so far as to level sharp criticism against his own country and its military leadership, while recognizing that Prussia had faced a formidable adversary in the strong Napoleonic army. Yet Clausewitz could not help but conclude that French victory was due less to modernity or numerical weight than to Napoleon's genius abetted by the intellectual poverty and moral cowardice of his opposition. 
Clausewitz's criticisms of the Prussian military were considered so inflammatory that they were not published in Germany for nearly 70 years. Clausewitz's captivity lasted until 1808, when he returned to the Prussian army as an assistant to General Gerhard von Scharnhorst, who is credited with the creation of the modern general staff system, and Clausewitz, in turn, was credited with helping to reorganize the army, whose structure and leadership he had so pointedly criticized. In 1810, Clausewitz was appointed a professor at the Academy of War in Berlin. Also that year, he and Marie married, apparently having overcome her mother's reservations about the suitability of the match. Letters chronicling their courtship showed another side of Clausewitz, far different than the cold-hearted military strategist as he has sometimes seemed to be. In love, Clausewitz became a poet, clearly influenced by the Romantic era, which valued aesthetic experience, intuition, and emotion, rather than the rationality of the Age of Enlightenment that was associated with the French Revolution. In war, though, Clausewitz became consumed with the art and science of the military campaign, Feldzug, as he called it, committing not only his intellect, but also his philosophical nature as well. He was clearly influenced by the German philosophers of his time, especially the great Immanuel Kant, from whom he learned two forms of truth, formal and material. In vom Kriege, he brought both together and used logic to produce abstractions, while remaining very much opposed to learning from history, understanding that, particularly on the battlefield, no circumstances or events are ever the same. Thus, Clausewitz can be seen as Kantian, while in substance, perhaps, one should say he was more like Wilhelm Friedrich Hegel, who played a major role in establishing German idealism. As biographer Peter Parrett wrote of Clausewitz, German philosophy gave him the means of subjecting war to logical inquiry. In his conviction to put a stop to Napoleon's conquest for total control of Europe, Clausewitz was a man of action. When Prussia refused to fight France due to a short-term alliance between the two countries, a disgusted Clausewitz joined the Russian army in 1812, a foray that earned him a brief mention in Leo Tolstoy's War and Peace about the French invasion of Russia. However, his actions took him forever out of favor of the Prussian king, Friedrich Wilhelm III, who thenceforth viewed him as a mutineer and revolutionary. Even after the alliance with France ended and Clausewitz was reinstated in the Prussian army in 1814, when Prussia waged war against Napoleon, Clausewitz served under the command of General Johann von Thielmann at the Battle of Wavre in 1815, the last major military action of the Hundred Days Campaign and the Napoleonic Wars in which Prussian troops dealt a decisive blow to Napoleon's forces, thus preventing additional French soldiers from joining the fight at Waterloo. After Waterloo, a defeated Napoleon was sent into final exile on the island of St. Helena in the South Atlantic, where he died in 1821. As for Clausewitz, despite a promotion to the rank of Major General in 1818, he too faced a banishment of sorts as he failed to curry any favor with the king. He was assigned to a desk job at the War College, an administrative post he would occupy for the next twelve years, and was expressly forbidden by the king to make any changes in the curriculum of the academy. Thus, as one historian wrote of him, Clausewitz, the man of fire, was reduced to tending embers. He would have most happily retired to a country farm to peacefully write, were it within his means. Those long years at the War College, however, allowed Clausewitz to spend hours each day contemplating his boundless notes from the front and composing them, in many cases more than once, into an exhaustive, if perhaps sometimes discordant, compilation. In 1830, Clausewitz finally saw military action again, with an appointment as chief of staff as the Prussian army mobilized on the Polish border, in response to a crisis in Poland and unrest elsewhere in Europe, that raised concerns of another major European conflict. When cholera broke out in the region in 1831, Clausewitz commanded the army's efforts to construct a sanitary zone to contain the deadly disease, but soon fell victim to it. Upon returning home, his spirits and his health seemed better for a short time, and he and his wife passed eight days together. On the ninth, he fell ill again, showing signs of cholera, and at the age of fifty-one, died after apparently suffering a heart attack. Following his death, Marie, assisted by her brother and two of Clausewitz's friends, arranged for the publication of his writings, with the first manuscripts appearing in 1832, 
and several more to follow before Marie's death in 1836. Unfortunately, for all her devotion to her husband and his work, Marie was not a professional editor, as the uneven, disjointed, and incomplete manuscript attests. Following Marie's death, the last two installments of Clausewitz's writings were published. An Attack of Misunderstanding Despite the genius of Clausewitz's insights, military historian Ralph Peters called Vom Kriege one of the most enduring texts of the era, save only Goethe's Faust, in its unfinished state, it became one of the most misunderstood books of the last two centuries. Quoted by many but read by few, Vom Kriege has been the target of misinterpretation and caustic attack. Clausewitz's most notable and vocal critic, Liddell Hart, waged a war of words against Vom Kriege with his own work, Strategy, The Indirect Approach, first published in 1954, 101 years after Clausewitz's death. An English infantry officer who had been gassed during World War I Hart had retired from the army as a captain in 1927 and spent the rest of his career as a military writer. At one point, he worked out for himself the plans for D-Day and wrote a critique of them, which he circulated among military officers and politicians, thus prompting Winston Churchill to call for his arrest for treason and suspicions of being a Nazi sympathizer. Instead, Hart was kept under surveillance, but later was exonerated and then knighted in 1966. In strategy, Hart cast Clausewitz as an apostle of total war, blaming him and his ideals for the carnage of the Western Front, asserting that European commanders had followed Clausewitz's dogma in the conduct of the Great War, which claimed more than 16 million military and civilian lives, making it one of the deadliest in human history. Such assertions against Clausewitz stemmed from his use of the word Gewalt, or force, the German equivalent of Lee giving the appearance that he advocated the use of direct assault in a pitched battle. As Hart asserted, accepting the Prussian philosopher of war, Clausewitz, as their master, they blindly swallowed his undigested aphorisms such as the bloody solution of the crisis, the effort for the destruction of the enemy's forces, is the firstborn son of war. Only great and general battles can produce great results. Blood is the price of victory. As a rebuttal to Clausewitz, Hart offered what he called the indirect approach to military strategy, believing it to be far superior to the direct assault that depletes the attacker and strengthens the resistance of the attacked. An indirect assault on a strategic point, Hart argued, weakens the opponent and thus avoids the high casualty rates that result from an all-out offensive against the enemy's entrenched positions. Hart's indirect approach was meant to discredit Clausewitz, whom he portrayed as advocating the straight-ahead bashing of armies in battles to the death. Hart's view, however, was skewed to the point of inaccuracy, and dare I say he got Clausewitz precisely wrong. In notice of 19 July 1827 in Vom Kriege, Clausewitz described two kinds of war, one to overthrow the enemy and the other to occupy some frontier districts to be annexed or used for bargaining during peace negotiations. Hart also failed to recognize in Vom Kriege the dual nature of war. On one hand, absolute in its violent tendencies, and on the other, limited by the political aims of those who use war as a political tool. Such duality of linked but disparate concepts, strategic, tactical, absolute, limited, attack, defense, and so forth, were part of the philosophical arguments of Clausewitz's time. Thus we can side with Clausewitz's defenders and their more recent analyses, the blame for the massive armed clashes and carnage of the Great War, as well as even of the wretched Nazis who also revered him, cannot be laid on Clausewitz, but rather on the generals and commanders who interpreted and applied his theories for their own purposes. If Clausewitz is at fault at all, it is because of the difficulty of understanding his text. On War – An Indirect Strategy Clausewitz's Vom Kriege is a dialectic approach to war, starting with the most basic premise, with a first chapter entitled, What is War? In it, he rejected the abstruse definitions of war used by publicists, and offered instead the image of two wrestlers. Each strives by physical force to compel the other to submit to his will. His first object is to throw his adversary, and thus to render him incapable of further resistance. Was Clausewitz, too, using Twee's show as his central metaphor? 
He later describes military engagements through handeln, which today refers to an exchange or trade, as preliminary in order to acquire an advantageous position, things which cannot be regarded as the destruction of enemy's force, but only leading up to it certainly by circuitous road, but with so much the greater effect. The possession of provinces, towns, fortresses, roads, bridges, magazines, etc., may be the immediate object of a battle, but never the ultimate one. Things of this description can never be looked upon otherwise than as means of gaining greater superiority, so as at last to offer battle to the enemy in such a way that it will be impossible for him to accept it. Therefore all these things must only be regarded as intermediate links, steps as it were, leading up to the effectual principle, but never as that principle itself. Handeln were the building blocks of war, both the immediate aims and the springboards towards the ends. Thus war was conducted through the interplay of tactics and strategy. In reading Clausewitz, it is often difficult to say where his tactics stop and strategy begins. Given the weighty, oftentimes incoherence of the tome, Clausewitz used a type of German that favored the past tense and produced long, confusing sentences. It becomes impossible and even irrelevant to say. In his study of strategic military history, he concluded that Swedish King Gustavus Adolphus, fighting in the Thirty Years' War, 1618 through 1648, was the first to demarcate and practice strategy from tactics, making him the father of military strategy. Having never read the Sun Tzu, Clausewitz was wrong, of course. To Clausewitz, the method of war was the employment of the available means for the predetermined end, an Aristotelian teleological framework made Clausewitzian with his additional concept of zeal, the intermediate aim. Clausewitz's zeal made clear that the very purpose of battle was not in achieving the ends of victory, the triumphant reward, but rather in acquiring the means to the ends. Thus, the aim of the battle was not absolute victory, not the ultimate end of peace. The aim of the battle was the means it afforded toward that ultimate objective. As these means are often far removed from the ends, both in time and space, they are often exceedingly indirect, the very paradoxical indirect efficacy of the Sun Tzu, and the path to Clausewitz's decisive victory in war is a protracted, roundabout path. He understood what it meant to go right in order to go left more decisively. One cannot help but think back to the conifers' withdrawal to the rocky, isolated places, so that they might one day occupy the fertile land from which they retreated. Even ultimate ends identified by Clausewitz had a nested relationship as the zvek of winning the war was subordinate to a higher zvek, the goal or end, also translated as purpose, of a lasting peace. Such higher-order ends were known as grand sure to the Taoists. When Clausewitz spoke of absolute war, it was not as an advocate for the bloody conquests of annihilation. Rather, he cautioned that a final peace must be ever-present in the mind, moving backward from that end and focusing on the intermediate positioning to achieve it. D. Mittel, means, also translated as instrument, just as the Sun Tzu instructs to go back to the subtle earlier steps to determine that which makes victory easy to win. Many translations have been less than rigorous in the distinctions between zeal and zvek, calling them aims, objects, ends, and goals. Thus, there has been ambiguity among these terms as presented by translators that Clausewitz never intended. Another concept of Clausewitz's roundabout approach and also gravely misunderstood, is the center of gravity, or Schwerpunkt. The center of gravity can best be thought of in mechanical terms, using a physics analogy, which was Clausewitz's intent, as a focal point. Such junctures become balance points, as modern military strategists have described, providing a certain centripetal, or center-seeking force, and thus perform a centralizing function that holds power systems together, and in some cases, gives them purpose and direction. The center of gravity strategy required the concentration of force in time and space, at the right place and the right time, at the decisive point, a major intertemporal theme of Clausewitz, like Sun Tzu. In the meantime, from a great distance, he arranges the conditions for success. This was Clausewitz's strategic end, leading to peace, the accumulated and pent-up military potential, finally emitted in a torrent, or better yet, not at all. He was very much against spreading forces thinly over a large area of engagement, preferring them to stay together, 
and instead aimed to separate the enemy's forces as a key positional advantage from which to strike its center of gravity. The sure in this approach should be obvious. The source of confusion around Clausewitz's center of gravity concept stems from the interpretation of these focal points as sources of strength. However, in his original German text, it has been noted Clausewitz did not refer to a source or Quella of strength. Rather, he wrote about the Gewicht, or full weight of the enemy's force, that could be traced to as few centers of gravity as possible, and areas in the enemy's configuration where there was Zusammenhang, or interdependence between various parts. A decisive blow to the center of gravity would ostensibly cause the enemy's entire structure to collapse, lessening or even eliminating the need for further assault. Thus Clausewitz, like Sun Tzu, shows his preference for striking when the configuration is optimal, so decisively or threateningly that violence then becomes unnecessary. An analogous concept with the Clausewitzian balance of power, which emerges spontaneously and operates like a law of nature. In the balance of power, Clausewitz observed the interaction of war and politics, whereby an aggressor nation upsets the balance of power and then expends its resources, stretching them too thin in an assault on an entrenched opponent. Thus, aggression is actually a disadvantage, while non-aggression accrues a decided advantage, as the defender then reaps where he is not sowed, as Clausewitz wrote, alluding to the Bible's parable of the talents from Matthew. Every suspension of offensive action either from erroneous views, from fear or from indolence, is in favor of the side acting defensively. From aggressor to non-aggressor, offense to defense, war is not a continual siege, but a succession of movements between tension and states of rest. Clausewitzian terminology, which anticipated verbatim the Misesian. During periods of tension, different gradations of immediacy exist between the aggressor, who seeks to act now, and the non-aggressor, who gains by waiting. When the aggressor's movement has been exhausted, what follows is a state of rest, a pause or equilibrium, which will lead to a new tension, in most cases in the opposite direction. Clausewitz emphasized an intertemporal strategy, particularly in the deployment of troops to gain the all-important setup for the eventual decisive point concentrated in time and space. At the onset of battle, he advised, which begins with a wearing-out exchange of fire designed to inflict casualties, a general should seek to minimize early losses, husbanding reserves, until the point when the balance shifts and the battle escalates. Clausewitz gave the example of two armies of 1,000 soldiers each. One side, however, sets aside 500 to deploy in subsequent stage and sends 500 into immediate battle against the 1,000. Each side is assumed to suffer 200 casualties. The 1,000 are a bigger target but fire more shots. But the smaller army gains the advantage when the 500 fresh troops it had husbanded in reserve enter the fight, facing a battle-weary, overextended opponent. Although the numbers of troops are now equal, each side has 800. It is now an uneven fight, as the previously smaller yielding army emerges with the advantage. The non-aggressor becomes the aggressor, and non-aggression trumps aggression. Later the soft overcomes the hard. Gaining superior positions from which to subsequently fight more effectively was, in fact, his method, through delayed riposte. It was a matter of intertemporalizing the fight into two phases of blow and counterblow, waiting for a blow and then parrying it, obver. He simplified it as beati sunt possidentis, blessed are those in possession. Clausewitz thus sums up the intertemporal trade-off with a very effective argument for cultivating one's resources now, upstream, even if it entails a retreat for strategic advantage later, downstream, in this way, it becomes evident how the employment of too many forces in combat may be disadvantageous, for whatever advantages the superiority may even give in the first moment, we may have to pay dearly for it in the next. Such was Napoleon's grave error in his invasion of Russia in 1812. The deployment of great masses of troops, the Lee, without the sure. Instead of achieving victory, Napoleon's Grand Army was routed. Sure. Ziel, Mittel, und Zweck. As the two great masters of the battlefield, Sun Tzu and Clausewitz teach us, victory lies at the very end of a roundabout path. In their now snarled Chinese-German, it first aims for the positional advantage of sure, 
a zeal that is the mittel for an ultimate Schweck. Here, too, we find the Austrians, with their singular focus on roundabout means or capital, that serve the attainment of a distant end, as Ludwig von Mises himself observed. The result sought by an action is called its end, goal, or aim. One uses these terms in ordinary speech also to signify intermediate ends, goals, or aims. These are points which acting man wants to attain only because he believes that he will reach his ultimate end, goal, or aim, in passing beyond them. The danger of not viewing things through this lens of means and ends is assigning an erroneous value on any given link in the chain. If we perceive things as separate, in essence, mistaking zeal for zvek, we focus only on the immediate, what can be seen, and we lose our depth of field. We lose any appreciation for that which cannot yet be seen. Now, with our understanding of sure and of zeal, mittel und zvek, we are ready to exit this span of two millennia and the great strategists who marked it, and move from Prussia to emerging Fond du Siècle Vienna, Austria, with a detour through France, a stone's throw in distance, and only a few decades hence, until we finally reach a great school of thought, whence Austrian investing ultimately takes shape.